Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, my name is Marla Quinn, and I'm the um, Ransom Municipal Coordinator here at ECIA. And um, I know everybody loves to do this, but we have a human basis here. Um, and let's do introduction. Or do some things to go. <laughs> Yeah. We'll catch her when she gets back. <laughs> Cheryl Gaines or Deputy Clerk Preston. Oh, Missy Connor, Grand Mountain. Chris Buddy, Delmer. Terry Smott, Worthington. Angie Overbrock, New Vienna, and Luxembourg. Linda Gall of Pearlville. Jessica Kennedy, Hepner. Amy Michaud, Wyoming. Percy Winkleman, Piasta. Kathy Gert, Cascade. Persia Meyer, Dyersville. Um, Chris Spencer, look at our home at Skirty, University of Michigan. Can we get the Zoom people to introduce themselves? Annette Ernst, Piasta. Harry Brown, Baldwin. Lynn Parker, Sabula. So first thing is um, ECIA updates, and Kim Glazer is going to give an update on our lead program. Oh, Trace is back. Oh, we just we just did an I'm sorry, Teresa. <laughs> Teresa Lineshade, City of Preston. Good morning. My name is Kim Glazer, and I'm with the ECIA. Um, I'm talking about three different programs, actually, that we have kind of currently been fortunate enough to obtain from the federal government from HUD, and I have a couple handouts. Our overarching theme of all our programs is its home repair. We help individuals, families of low to moderate income improve their homes. So it's three buckets of funding, but for your information, you don't care. <laughs> we kind of make the decision what best fits our clients. And I know some of you I've worked with and have had great experience with. Most of you I have not. Uh, we previously were just in Dubuque and Delaware County, but now we've been fortunate enough to get funding in all five of our community or our counties. So I hope to work with all of you in all of the counties. So I'm just going to start a few handouts here. We pass them around. The first one specifically is the older adult home modification program. And that is designed for individuals over the age of 62. They would need to own their own home. They don't allow anybody renting a home. For that program but the goal is to have the older elderly individuals stay in their home for as long as we can make happen we want them to you know not have to go to an assisted care facility or you know really make their home livable for as long as we can and so we have an individual here with us uh, she's a healthy home six, uh, inspector, and now she manages the older adult program. And she partners with an occupational therapist from Mercy One, who is very, very knowledgeable. But both of those go into the homes of the elderly, you know, over 62, that fall within that area median income. And they assess the property and the resident. So they want to see what can best help these individuals stay in their home. Uh, sometimes it's a walk-in shower, it may be a ramp, it may be a lift chair. Um, you know, there's several different options. On average, they have 5,000 to spend in a home, which sometimes isn't much if we do have to do a lot of 
bathroom work, but we are able on certain instances to ask for additional funding and get a high cost approval. So we have done more than 5,000 per property. So it depends on the circumstance and the property and you know the resident. So never try to guess if something's gonna work for a person because we have many variables, many situations, and we try to do what's best for that client. So again, that whole modification program is wonderful. There is no uh, cost to the homeowner. There is no match by a city or county for that particular program. So always, you know, be thinking of those in your communities who could need, you know, use a hand up to remain in their homes. We do a lot of different you know, remediations, a lot of different modifications to assist that with people, you know, aging in place is kind of the, the words we use. The other two funding opportunities that we've received, and they're also in all five counties, are one is specifically for lead hazard control, and the other is for healthy homes. And again, for you, it wouldn't be anybody, even the owner's really decision how, which one of those programs we would use because most people don't think they have lead paint in their home. They have no idea. But usually if the home's built before 19, uh, or after, yeah, before 1960, we almost always find lead. I mean, it's a very, very high percentage of those homes have lead, even though people are no, have no clue about that. So the, the good thing about the lead program, we are used to help make homes safer for families with children under six. However, it doesn't have to be the child living in your home full time. It could be a grandchild, it could be a niece, nephew, neighbor, baby, you know, somebody <laughs> might babysit. It's all over the board who could qualify for somebody age under the age of six that could help, you know, get this funding. The best thing also about the lead program is it has the most funding. On average, we can do 25,000 in a home. Typically we're doing replacement windows. Sometimes it's siding, soffit, fascia, porches, uh, basements. There's just a lot of things that we tend to find lead on. And usually in those older homes, it has chipping and cracking and peeling. And that's what we determine as a hazard. So those are the items we're replacing with the lead funding. That funding does have a match requirement from the federal government that we have to pass on to those who use the funding, typically uh, county or city. Um, it's like 1,600 a unit. Now we've tried to look at some other options to obtain match and there is some local money here that we've gotten. So if that's an issue, we've tried to work through the issue. We don't want to turn anyone away, any family in need away. We try to work through you know, that match issue as best we can, but you know, they, they get a lot, of, a lot of work done to their property. So it does improve you know, homes in your community and we feel it's worth it. Uh, when we ask for match, you know, you are helping the, the health and safety of your citizens. Um, the we've spent, I shouldn't say this, but we've spent up to seventy thousand in some homes. So it's a dramatic difference. On the page, you can see, um, you know, like I said, when we're doing siding and windows and soffit patient, it's a complete transformation. So it is a big deal, and I know specifically in Hopkinton, we've made some really big differences to probably quite a few of their homes and, and it's made a difference. And, and they're very happy with what they see from this funding. I know we just did one in Del Mar. So, you know, we're just kind of expanding into the counties that we've never been in, but we're here to make a difference and really make the homes safer for your citizens. Healthy homes is similar to lead. It's just not specific that we have to find lead paint in the home. We can go in and we look for all different types of hazards. Excuse me. It's sometimes electrical. It could be plumbing, moisture, 
Um, we don't want to announce this too loudly either, but we've done roofs, we've done pest um, infestation, we've all over the board done, you know, concrete and like I said, it's it's a very, very flexible funding. It's a great funding. That program does not have match. So, I mean, there's too many intricate details and one program has this and that, but that's not for you to worry about. And I, I want to stress that because, you know, we go, we do the assessment of the property after they qualify with us. Again, it's that income bear or income qualification that they have to be under 80% area median income. But like for a person of one, it's like 49,000. Um, I know a lot of people I know qualify as a single person making under 49,000. So the guidelines, the income guidelines are very generous. So it's not like low poverty level, very generous. You know, a family of four is like 70,000. It, it's really pretty good and obtainable. I should mention also the uh, the Lead and Healthy Homes program, we can do rental units also. It's single family homes, it's also rental units. So we qualify based on the tenants in those units. We don't qualify. I know some people are a little bit funny. They don't like to see, sometimes the landlords may have uh, some wealth, but yet they own these properties rental units that they don't always keep much above the minimal standards. So the federal government feels it's our place to help these families that live in, unfortunately, unmaintained homes. So we also do rental units and some of them we've seen have been pretty bad. And we, we try to, you know, work as a partner with the landlord to improve those living conditions, you know. If we're putting money in them, often we see the owners and the rental owners motivated to make these units better. So, you know, we've had very good success with improving properties. I hope I've covered everything. You know, basically overarchingly, we want to make homes safer for families, especially small children, you know, who's it's not their control that the roof's leaking, there's lead paint falling all over their house. You know, we we do it for the kids, you know, we do it for the families. It makes a difference. Lead poisoning as a percentage of the population when I started in this business in 2008 was like 13, 15% of the kids were lead poisoned. Now it's way down like below 3%. It, it makes a difference. They've spent a lot of money in our homes and it makes a difference. I feel very fortunate and lucky that here in Iowa, we've got so much funding in our area because it's competitive. And a lot of times it could go to New York, Baltimore, you know, these big cities get a lot of this money. So we've got it. I always stress, let's use it. There's a lot of pride in rural America, rural Iowa, I believe. And I think that's something you have to encourage people to get over with. This is money, you know, they work hard, they pay their taxes. You know, this is money now for helping people here. And I just encourage everybody to think about citizens that may could use a hand with their home repair. It, it's very dramatic, it's very transformational, and it really makes a difference in the lives of these families. Any are there questions? any deadlines or do you have, you know, how long this will continue as far as if we would advertise it or try to put yeah. it out there? The older adult has two years left. Okay. And the healthy dog homes has like three. Mm -hmm. And the bigger pot of lead money, which is five million, is four years. And the beauty of it is that we apply for new funding when it's running out. Now, there's definitely no guarantee, but we've had good success, and usually they refund areas that have good success. So, you know, it's there is the Dubuque, Delaware one is ending, but the new, the new one we've got is already covering those areas again. So, we're not running out of money in any area. They're all fully funded for a few years, up to four. Any yeah. questions? <laughs> Other questions? Jim, are the income guidelines the same for each of the programs? There's yes, the they are. So if they qualify for one, they qualify for them all. And that's why 
can sort of say this, I must got distracted, but we go in and we assess the property and we determine what's best. If they have kids and they have a lot of lead, we're going to put the most money through from the lead program. If they just do not have any kids that visit, we'll use the healthy homes funding. Um, you know, we've tried and at certain times it's worked and I don't know HUD's kind of not given us clear direction. We sometimes use the lead money and then the older adult if it's a grandmother who needs assistance. So sometimes that has worked. So we try to make the most and give the most bang for the buck when we go in and determine where we can spend the most money to do the best work, have the biggest impact. Thank so, you. yeah, I hope everybody got the pamphlets. If you need any more, Marla can find me, and I appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, the contact information is on these pamphlets. There's a phone number and a email. Okay, well, website. Sorry, I didn't inform. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Dan Fox, uh, senior planner with ECIA. I am here to talk to you today a little bit about the Safe Streets and Roads for All grant that the ECIA Transportation Department applied for uh, and received. Uh, the purpose of the funding is to develop a comprehensive, comprehensive safety action plan for all cities within Dubuque, Delaware, Jackson, and Clinton counties, except for uh, the city of Portland. Uh, so this funding comes from the US DOT program called Safe Streets and Roads for All, or SS4A, that was created by the most recent transportation legislation that was passed. It, the, the legislation sets aside about a billion dollars a year for the whole country for improving transportation safety. And that funding is split out into two types of grants, implementation and planning grants. So to get, to be able to access the implementation dollars to fund safety improvement projects, an area needs to have an adopted comprehensive safety action plan. So through this program, through the planning grant that we have, we will be developing that plan that will allow the communities in our area to apply for implementation funds at some point in the future. So we are hoping to be able to start on this, uh, this planning process as soon as we get a contract in place with the USDOT for this funding. And so hopefully that'll be within the next month or so. Um, so we will be reaching out to each of the communities uh, over the summer and uh, collecting your input and feedback uh, on what your safety needs are uh, and what projects you may have and would want to see implemented uh, through future transportation safety funds. So as, as part of the development process of this plan, a lot of it will be based on data and analysis. And so we will be working with the Institute of Transportation or INTRANS at Iowa State University uh, to help us with that data analysis piece. Uh, but the other piece that's, that is really important is gonna be um, the feedback from the cities uh, and other stakeholders within each community uh, and also the, the public and people uh, that live in, in each community as well. Uh, so we have we have hired a summer intern that's going to be helping us with this process. So Carla is over there. Um, so she will be helping us with the outreach to each of the communities uh, over the summer. And so if you if you uh, receive information from her, you know, she's going to be helping us work on setting up meetings and uh, starting that process of collecting information. Uh, so did I did I miss anything, Chandra? Is there so uh, one thing when we are scheduling meeting with you guys. Make sure that you got the key people who understand your city and what's the issue within your city. So, what we want to know is near misses. There are a lot of areas where you might say, "Hey, there's no crash data, but there's a near miss there." You know, our people are speeding. We need that kind of information. And uh, once someone provides that information, someone like the police department or sheriff's office should agree with that. Otherwise, the federal highway will say, "How did you even authenticate this?" You know. 
So this should be checks and balances throughout the process. So make sure when you're scheduling the meeting, you have key people at that meeting. So are there population requirements? No, every city and any city will be covered. Uh, okay. Now, big cities, obviously, uh, like for example, Diaspora, will have a work session with them because they have more projects within their area. Small cities will have a Zoom meeting there uh, because uh, as you have like a couple of streets, so it will be easy for us to discuss with you online in that case. And with online meetings, the good thing is we can record those meetings and give it time state for them to analyze. So. And I, I guess another thing to add is that because there is implementation funding available, we will be looking at identifying projects that can be part of a future application that have funded uh, to, to help uh, implement these, these projects. Since we're working with a lot of smaller communities, we may try to look for opportunities to combine uh, multiple projects together into one application uh, that could be that could be funded just to, to create a bigger project because it would be easier to fund with a little bit better one. Um, and so I think I think that's everything. Um, oh, can we go ahead and update on that? Uh, yeah, so we are planning to have those projects ranked next week, and so we'll be moving that process forward. Uh, can you explain so, what RCGP is? Oh, yeah, so that's the rural county transportation program. So each of the four counties within our RPA area has created a grant program, a transportation grant program uh, that's aimed at small cities. So the the current round is ongoing and for funding for the next fiscal year, so FY 2024. Those uh, that that program is is funded by the county, but it's administered by and by ECIA. So applications have been submitted. We're working on processing those now, and we have a ranking committee that's scheduled to meet next week, as I said, and they will rank those applications, provide recommendations to the county board of supervisors, who then approve those uh, those funding needs. What kind of projects does the program fund? So it funds uh, transportation related projects. So improvements to streets and roads um, and other safety improvements, some types of safety improvements as well. Uh, so things like uh, safe routes to school projects and things like that. Oh, safe correction, safe route to school. If you're having, having a new subdivision, uh, it's still a responsibility within the new subdivision to get a safe route to school. Uh, we cannot fund any projects that are with brand new subdivision, engineers and getting uh, that. Make sure uh, most of this problem will be like sidewalks within your town hall that you need to there. So, you know, the signal system or your lights, amber lights, something like that. Uh, but just give us a call if you have a project and we can work with the county engineer on that. A uh, couple more things. Uh, there's a lot of questions from the group regarding the trail funding. Uh, right now, IODOT is looking into that because of the new transportation bill. There's a legal issue with the trail funding. So they're trying to segregate the trail funding from Safe Routes to School, which should be a standalone program in this new transportation bill. So they're working on that. We'll keep you posted. Obviously, there are a couple of cities who want to plug for Safe Routes to Schools here. So we'll keep you posted on that. Uh, the other thing, if IODOT is working within your community, give us a call. Uh, don't call us when you're going into a big letting. Recently, we found that IODOT is working with one of our cities. And the city actually to said, hey, by the way, DOD is working with us. Yeah, we are able to look into some funding sources for them, but give us a CV that will help us to line up some RPA funds in this case. So we did work with Luxembourg uh, this year, and uh, we'll be working with Cascade at next meetings. Did I miss anything, Dan? No, Thank you, guys. Right, thanks. Next up, we're going to learn about recovery from disaster and the local community role. I'll let these folks introduce themselves. Some of you know Mandy from Delaware County. Thank you. 
Are you able to share okay? Yeah. I love that storm picture. It's really cool. <laughs> it's big. It's a, it's yeah. a um, the whole storm is spinning, right? Uh, so, I mean, I hope nobody got hurt, but it's a little All right. Uh, Hello, guys. My name is Kurt Spencer. Um, I'm from the Homeland Security. Public assistance recovery. Um, I've got a couple of folks who uh, came with me. I'll let them go ahead and introduce themselves. Dylan. I'm Dylan Lundy. Uh, I'm on my security nurse management and I'm on the medication side. Uh, Sarah Berenger and I am with grants management and monitoring or the closeout side. Graham Giles. Uh, I do the field delivery, so I'm usually the first guy wrapping you like. Well, got damaged. <laughs> <laughs> and Chrissy Mercant had a little throat issue today, so she can't talk. So glad Chrissy could join us. Uh, thank you, Marla. Thank you, Mandy, for having us. We appreciate it. Um, I know you have a ton of questions, right? From FEMA, the four letter word to some degree, right? But this photo fits in because this is not a, this is the whole storm spinning, right? All of us, who's in the derecho here? I was. I went to about Cal that day. I was stuck in the middle of it, right? I actually took time off work, right? I was on going back to the house in a um, truck with you. So this is very indicative of what we're experiencing down here. Christine, would you go to the next slide, please? So just a couple of overview pieces, right? Next slide. So we are Kevin a little bit more. Basically, even with the murderization that's occurring in the state of Iowa, the governor said, I want these guys to actually report directly to me, right? And the reason that is, is because the governor actually knows the, or how important the response and recovery are to the state, right? And so we're actually divided up in two distinct categories. The response side, which is like, um, you actually need to um, get comps Sandbags. We need to get uh, trucks because there's so many, so much debris from the derecho and recover set, which is kind of what we like. Right? We take the um, after the response to or or recovery begins, right? And recovery, whether it's short term or long term. Yeah. Hopefully, your um, town or county has not been. You know, doesn't need long term recovery, but if it does, we do the short and long term. So, Christine, go to the next slide. So, you may not actually under, you may not think about this, but you know, since 2011, we're in the top five in the nation for a presidential nuclear disaster. So, what I mean is, we actually have more than Texas, more than Florida, there's a way better. Those are our states. It shows you how often, how frequent we experience that, right? Just with the flood that's occurring in Mississippi right now, or that did occur, you know, for the lower um, counties is still occurring. And Christine, next slide, please. Okay, this is something we've got all kind of seen, right? Just some photos that um, kind of reflect, you know, um, um, recovery here, you know, response, um, Cedar Rapids. Um, and this was June 2008 for all those to remember. So drought, well, it's actually not a recovery uh, item. Um, response, USDA, there may be times 
when your city goes in our jail, whether it's water uh, mitigation measures or water saving, right? You can't water your lawns or, or structures. Next thing. The Indian bird flu, right? We all live in a very rural state, very agricultural state, heavy state, right? So whether it's um, avian bird flu and how we're dealing with that, those are the habits, right? Right the road, right? The 2019 flood. Um, I, I think this photo speaks for itself. We can all just like, have, we're still dealing with the ramifications of that, and we're going to be dealing with them for the next 30 years, right? Because we lost so many trees, it's going to take a while for the canopy to regrow like it It may never come back. No, I'm going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so one thing that we want to kind of uh, put out there is I'll just ask for the local that begin local and local, right? Whether it's your local fire department, your local EMA, I'll just ask our local. You've been responsible. You actually, your residents are going to come to City Hall, right? They're not going to come to the, they're, they may eventually wind up with the capital building to, the, you know, but. You know, when the, when the stuff is in the fan, they're going to go to the fire department. They're going to go to the police station, right? So here's a case where local resources should be used first, right? And then if local resources are exhausted, that's when you're, you know, um, you reach out and you call Andy or your EMA and you say, hey, we need these all those banks. We need these pumps because we're flooded. We need stand back, right? Um, and then maybe it's going to actually go through what's on the web you'll see, which is our basically the communication system we have with all our email coordinators throughout the state and all nine and counties where they put in resources that need or immediate that or beyond um, local capacity. Okay, so, okay, so well. Local resources, mutual aid, if you have an agreement maybe with a neighboring city or if your county has an agreement with a neighboring county, then actually you get to the state. Okay, EMAC is a fancy word. It's a fancy acronym. It basically means um, we have agreements with other states. We can pull other resources from your rest states. And then federal, which is through FEMA, USDA, Small Business Administration, Okay, so basically, this is uh, more of a graphic that all emergency managers use, right? Pretty much in every function of emergency life, right? And you're saying, that sounds like a really lot of me. So your capital plan, your comprehensive plan, not only for um, your entity, but for your county and the um, COG as a whole. Is all to do this, right? Mitigation, priorities, they can be things such as wait, we need a major detention park and uh, where our uh, parks are, or we need to actually elevate our lift stations, right? Or we need to actually have a, a flood barrier around our uh, water plant or sewer plant. So this will never stop drilling. That's the reason it's very stubborn. Right, response leads into recovery, which leads to mitigation, which leads to fairness, taking this job. Right, so a couple things, right, for emergency managers of your county, right? Basically, um, so the all contact from the state level, right, when a disaster happens or an event happens, right, whether it's a derecho flooding on the Mississippi, uh, to an event, all the communication. From the state emergency management is going to happen uh, through the county emergency manager, right? Um, just a couple of things here state resources are not provided to individual citizens, right? They are provided to the entity, right? To the, to the government, entity, right? And um, in order to provide state resources, there has to be a governor's proc, not a FEMA declaration 
a governor's proclamation, right? Difference is proclamations are made at the gubernatorial level, right? Proclamations are made at the, excuse me, um, declarations are made at the federal level. Um, just a couple of things that actually um, governor's proclamation can cover, right? Um, so basically, if there is a problem, it lists the impacted county. Um, it actually turns on the individual assistance uh, at the state level, right? And activate on a merger response plan for the entire state, right? And that way, it cascades to each um, state entity, whether it's DOT, DNR, Homeland Security. Um, and then that actually goes provides resources to the local jurisdictions. Okay, the emergency plan, I don't expect anybody in here to remember this. That's just divide up into 15 functions. That's all it is, right? So we are the coordinate entity for pretty much every function. Each function is going to have its own kind of subject matter expert, like transportation is, of course, going to be item, right? Um, prior pattern is, of course, going to be DL. Um, so basically, when the governor's pocket made, let's get the individual assistance for our citizens is turned on state, okay? The one difference that I want to point out here is right now, the Department of Health Human Services is currently implementing this, right? As of July 1st, with the organization of the state government, it's going to come over to Iowa Home Security, right? John Pugh says it's going to not know the difference, right? Hopefully, we're going to make it more of an easier transition, so an easier application process. Um, so we basically, when our response is operated, what's out of the CI, right? So a state emergency operation center, right? So when it's actually activated by the governor's proclamation, as staff 24 is happening. Okay, we're just a list of our key, key state partners, right? And then here's our key federal partner. Right. Uh, basically, uh, FEMA reaches seven in KC. It has um, four states Iowa, Nebraska, Missouri, Kansas, nine tribes. And so basically, when if something happens and we search for a federal declaration for a lot of assistance or individual assistance, it's done through KC on us. Okay. And then basically, okay, so all that was kind of an intro, if you want, just you can totally forget if you need to. So basically, PA, right, <clears throat> public assessment is for local government entities, right, our government entities, it's at in certain nonprofits. It's not for the individual citizens. I know public assessors, they get, oh, John can help, right? But the difference is public assistance is for infrastructure, for mm -hmm. infrastructure, for um, cities, counties, for um, states, for um, certain private nonprofits such as hospitals, churches, houses of worship. So what it covers is actually the removal, what we term as emergency protective measures, search and rescue, sandbagging. Um, generators and then to restore or to repair back to uh, buildings, uh, equipment, and other infrastructure. Okay, so everything is in the van, the emitter terms, right? So, okay, basically, every applicant is their own student, right? So, by what I mean is every applicant kind of plays. Kind of can uh, lay the foundation for their success. Right now, when the staff happens and you're uh, responding to an event, you should be communicating with your EMA partner, right? 
And granted, at that point, you need partners up to your elbow, up to their elbows, and and out, right? Um, but so you may have to take some of that on as long as far as proper record keeping, right? In the grant world, I bring grants, I've been grant for um, uh, implementation, I've been a grant monitor. If it's not black and white in the grant world, did that happen? So when an event happens, you want to treat every event like it's going to be a presidential declared disaster. Because if it is grant funded, if it's not documented, you get that. Okay. And that goes for all your grants. Right. So um, ways to support the county email, stay in constant contact with them. I know Mandy probably is gonna hate me for saying this, but to the point, I would rather you guys bug me. And maybe we like Chris, I wish you would have said that, than to actually not be mean to contact, right? Because I, it sounds as gold to some degree, not in a disaster, not in a response, not in a government. Attend email meetings. So if your county EMA has a meeting, make sure somebody's there, make sure somebody's in with the Don't just send the guy on the very group, don't just send a guy. Uh, on the park screen, right? Send somebody who has some authority who can actually kind of understand their verbiage that's being thrown, understands finances, understands, you know, response in general, whether it's police or fire. And report everything they make. So whether you think it's covered by insurance or not covered by insurance, whether you think it's important or not, once again, information is not, right? So, what we are is it's almost like baking a cake, right? If we're asking Mandy, we want this wonderful chocolate cake, but we're saying, no, nah, maybe you can have eggs, flour. We maybe needs all that information. She needs all of those ingredients to make that cake, right? Um, approach everything like so it'd be dead. A small event, one building can make a difference, right? To as far as the county or even the state meeting of the and we'll get into that in a second. Um, every disaster, whether it's federal or not, doesn't end up as local, right? It's not going to be the president is not going to get that phone call from um, your resident. Guess what? Your mayor, your city administrator, your city manager is going to get that phone call. Um, PA funding is your tax dollars one. Right, so put them in the best use you can. Okay, so once again, you guys drive the train on the recovery side, right? So here's kind of a screenshot, and this is available on Alabama Security website as well. And um, this presentation, I think, Mindy, think you get a copy of the PDF version, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, right. Can we? Is there? Can we send it out to everyone? Sure. Or be out here already, right? And the reason I want to send it out to everyone is that way everyone and it's like well, it's going to. I wouldn't remember this, or I would be un. I guess un. Would not expect you guys to remember this, right? But the state of Iowa has a threshold, right? For the statute to be federally declared, we have to meet it. So we're five million dollars, right? That's all not in our campus. Each county has a threshold that have to meet, right? If they do not meet that threshold, or if we don't meet it as a state overall, we are not going to qualify for a federal disaster, which can make the application to the president, right? And guys, if you have any questions, go ahead to the answer, throw them out, please. Right? Okay, so here's out of the timeline of the night, right? So, disaster occurs, right? Local EMAs submit within the first 72 hours, they're kind of the Twitter version of what this happened, right? What they see the biggest and baddest teams to start. Did that web you'll see tool that we talked about, that we communicate with our <clears throat> right here. Right, is when we say there is big enough, bad enough damages that we think 
we actually need to go in and look at the damages so we can make our request to the president. Right, our local damage assessment. We're going to work with our EMIT partners, right? But we actually may work with you too. So do do uh, many of our other EMAs throughout the state. We're probably going to reach out to you, or they're going to reach out to you and ask you for your biggest and baddest damages, right? Not only do you need to um, say what damage, but provide a cost estimate, provide photos, right? With that, what document, 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 once again, the grant world is not black and white, it did not happen, right? Even though this is recovery, right? Her response is still a grant. Right? So, and then after all that, and we verify, we submit a request, plus draw on what's terms of joint PD, right? That preliminary damage assessment, we submit that to the FEMA kind of reviews, they may come out and do some specific on site. Once again, that's where we'll see Graham a lot. Is Graham is going to be one of those guys that are going to be like, Graham, why do you bother me? Or, but Graham is trying to get as much information as he can because, right? So, right there, that state submits a declaration request. If this information right there is not high, it's not good. The president's just going to kick back and say, no, 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 right? So we sit on that. The president makes a deck, okay? So we do the IDR, the first step in the process, right? The initial damage, Twitter, after. What's the first image of ours by each county you may, right? Um, so how do um, Get this information to the MAs. Well, how do you email, right? Within the first 24 to 40 hours, email what's going on, email what you see, email what you what you witness, email what residents are saying, email the pictures they've sent you, email all this stuff to your email partners, right? Or take the email and all the documentation for your records, right? So that way, if you're audited or whatever, yeah. once again, look at this at, in, in terms of grant, right? Okay. So, what should I provide my county be? Provide a broad overview of what the uh, your town is experiencing. What I mean is, yes, you want to run the damages, but also like a, a a very short snap or a very short like one or two sentence kind of. Summary of what's going on. Hey, roads are shut off, can't get to the hospital. Roads are shut off, can't get to school. How is that across our town? Okay. <clears throat> We've set up a, uh, a warming center because it's in the river water. Well, we set up a cooling station because for our generators to run the city hall or the fire station. Okay. Quick kind of estimation of damages or dollars, right? And it could be something, once again, this is what we call a swag, a street while guests, right? At that point. And then identify critical facility damage. If there is damage to the city hall, if there is damage to the fire station, if there is damage to the school, right? Um, what should uh, EMA report? Well, HSMD, HSMD after the, the initial IDR, will have to reach out, review the IDR information for all nine and counties. And then we'll be in contact. Usually we'll review it the same day it comes in, right? Within the first every two hours of the IDR. And then we'll have to reach out to all nine counties and say, hey, guess what? Within 10 days, we need this local damage assessment for these counties, right? Um, like typically it's 10 to 14 days. Now, I will say this. In the past, I guess the recent past, this has been, you could probably say, right? Because there's been a lot of political pressure to recover as fast as we can, right? So, um, how can I provide more reports to you? Maybe? Well, actually, that communication piece, right? Ask your EMS how they want the information. The LTA, whether they want a spreadsheet, whether they want it in a Word document at this point. Remember, it's 
Yeah, sorry. Um, so I was just curious. Grand Mountain recently had a tornado that came through, but is this more so just when it's affecting like the whole community as a resource, you know, our roads or public buildings? But what about the citizens when it's you know their windows are blown out? Is that more? Do we report anything to our EMA then, or is it just? Yes. Yeah. So I, I can cover that. Okay. Um, so recently we had two tornadoes touch down in Delaware County on March 31st, and yeah. it was part of a 29 tornado outbreak across the right. state of <laughs> Iowa. And so the local damage assessment is done. Um, when it talks about turning on state IA assistance, um, that is $5,000 that your citizens can receive. However, everything that we're talking about today is income dependent. Yeah. So if they don't meet the qualifications and they're really, whoa, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's hard to qualify for individual assistance. Um, so you're looking at, and that's kind of why we're talking about the local role in recovery is what can you guys as local communities do to prepare yourselves for those instances? So, um, like I said, we had two tornadoes touch down. We had approximately 70 addresses that sustained damage. Uh, we had farm buildings completely leveled, trees through houses and everything. Uh, we barely squeaked by in meeting our county threshold, which was $77,000. Um, and then the state, with everybody across the state, all of the damage that you guys saw on the news did not meet the threshold for uh, FEMA to come in. So when you guys are in your council meetings and you're in your uh, planning yeah. meetings and you're talking about your community, you really need to not expect any of this to come in. You should be planning and having the focus of it is us and for sure it's us for the first three days. So things like sheltering, making sure that you have shelter plans in place locally to, um, that was one of the things that came up in our tornado was we needed to open a shelter. Well, I'm only one person, so I'm dealing with the fire department and I'm dealing with the police department. And so I actually called and said, hey, can you go open up this shelter? Let me know if anybody shows up. If they do, we'll get a generator there and we'll get lights on and, and really start the process. 99% of the time in Iowa, people go to friends and family, so it's not that big a deal. But it will be down to the local people to be doing those items. It will be up to you to be opening cooling shelters, opening um, heating facilities, to be sheltering your people. Um, there will be local community organizations that will come in. So for us, we have the United Methodist Chainsaw Team that comes in. Um, and they helped people tarp their roofs. They helped people uh, get trees out of their houses, those kind of things. But it is really super at the local level to help your citizens. Um, and that's why we have what's called a long-term recovery committee. Um, in Delaware County, it's called the Delaware County Disaster Recovery Committee. That's a local committee that has put together money so that if there are unmet needs in the community, uh, that we can take a look at those, people can apply, and then we can assist them with any needs that weren't met. Um, but people filing with their insurance company and dealing with all of that, if they're insured, then even a lot of this stuff does not apply. So it is really on the local governments to get your citizens through those first few days of where do we take debris, how do we dispose of it, um, getting the message out how to communicate with the you know, insurance company and where you can go providing them with resources of if their insurance company has given them the runaround, this is the state office you can contact and they'll help you with that. Iowa Legal Aid, giving them that kind of information. Um, because it is it, extremely hard to qualify for a lot of these programs. I mean, you're talking about way down federal poverty level before you're going to get that five thousand dollars so out of the 70 addresses we had that were impacted uh we had one that actually applied and qualified for the assistance um and then you're looking at if you have farmers all of their assistance comes through the usda and so navigating them through those channels and then if you have small businesses, all of that goes through the Small Business Association or Administration. And so really your 
one of your biggest roles after the disaster will be helping your citizens navigate through all of these different programs that are there to help them. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really going to come down to local people, local help, local resources. So um, in my budget, I have started setting aside about $5,000 a year that will be used for disaster response because if I need to feed people at a shelter, I can't wait for all of these channels to start coming through when I can call Walmart and be like, here's my credit card. I need a pallet of water. I need a pallet of um, ready to eat meals. Those kind of things to feed your population um, have to happen very quickly. So there's a kind of this formula, the world is seven meals away from complete anarchy. So um, when people are hungry, they get really rude. So making sure that you're able to procure those resources is really important. And so, I mean, even like the flooding along the Mississippi, which is extremely significant, Clayton County was calling us and asking for pumps. We sent pumps to Clayton County. Um, it's really all about within your local governments working together on a very local level. So um, to be expecting that every disaster FEMA is gonna come swooping in and write a check and pay for everything, it's not gonna happen. And if it does, it's going to happen very, very slowly. The 2008 floods were just closed out by the state this year. So that was the last payments were sent out. The last projects were kind of closed out. Those you know, that is when that was sent. So you have to be looking at, you know, small towns are going to have to put that bill in the beginning. You know, anything that you do, you're, you're, it's kind of all based on reimbursement. So you're putting that bill in the beginning and then, you know, it might be five, 10, 13 years later, you're getting that back and your projects are getting paid for. But in the initial three days, six months, year, you guys are the ones that are going to have to be putting that out. And especially things like overtime. You know, if you guys have one good week of where your public works people are busting their humps and putting in an 80-hour work week at overtime, you know, how much does that do to your budget? So do you have funds set aside that are specific for disaster response that you can take from so that at the end of the year, you're not looking at a budget shortfall because you had to utilize people. Is there funding at a state level for disasters? Because I can tell you the state is cutting city's budgets. This last year, property tax reform, and there's more coming our way. I mean, especially in these little tiny towns, there's not going to be money. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I clerk for a town of 5,000, but I also clerk for a town of 150. That town of 150 gets hit with a disaster. Yep. We don't have the money. Mm -hmm. No, right now, the only time you get, I mean, you get state resources, basically when the governor makes a profit. Uh, but there's all the time you get refunded for disasters is when the FEMA makes a declaration. Right? It is a contingency fund, but it's yeah. very limited. So the contingency fund is state run, but it's a million dollars yeah. right now. At first come, first serve. So a million dollars for the state is not a lot of money. So I, I would say make sure you're, uh, I would tell you all, right? Make sure you're elected officials from that very, very thing to your legislature, right? So I cannot tell you, and I'm glad many was here for that, but this is so key. That is so key. And attend meetings and have people that can actually, you know, uh, whether it's the mayor, city manager, plug works director, right? Because what Mandy said is actually basically you have to, you have, people have to be able to make decisions, right? You can't just send the guy who draws the mows your park, right? Right. Because he can help him out. So keep going. Keep going. Okay. Okay, All right. This is kind of what Mandy was talking about a little bit. Local damage, right? What I'm going to say to you, we're not, we don't have to go over all this, right? Estimate costs, right? Now keep in mind, this is only for public infrastructure. It's not individual, right? 
um, GPS points, and we know how the addresses work, right? Photos and insurance coverage, right? The reason this is the big one because the menu said is true. Right? So basically, if you have a CBR and it's covered by insurance and it's damaged, FEMA is not going to include that because the insurance is going to make it up. Now, they will pay for the deductible. So, say the deductible in the CBR is you've got a million dollar policy, the deductible is 10000 They won't pay for the deductible, right? But if it was caused by um, this disaster, but if it's covered by insurance, then we'll not pay for the rest of it. Okay. okay. So, one of our, our colleagues actually helped us with this slide. So, I'm going to give um, credit to Ricardo, who works in, um, with Graham. And so, basically, I can't tell you how many times a photo can actually address a question for us in mass, right? Photo, photo, photo. And what I would encourage all you guys to do is this is the a little bit of how FEMA is transitioning their thinking, right? And not just FEMA, but in any disaster recovery funding base, right? Whether it's funding behind um, or it's funding through a FEMA. Have your guys in the public works better go from camp and drive the streets right now. Right? And the reason I say that is so you could show FEMA the condition before the disaster of the streets. Because what they're going to argue with you is even if a street or culvert is damaged by like a flooding event, they're going to say, maybe it was already, there was some already damage previous before, the road may not be in the best shape. You know, we all know that guess what? If something is not damaged, if you don't need to have code back, if you don't need to, you know, um, repay it, you're not going to. So you might not have, there might be a, a tenured gap from the last invoice for that section of road to the current, right? So what I'm saying is if you have that documentation, I know it's a pain that took us, but if you have it, you can show up to the FEMA, the roads were in great shape. Also, right, like if you've got your maintenance guys doing stuff, but there's mowing on the time guide, right? You know, mowing this road all. You know, the clean tension, clean coat. They can write on the time cut there. Now you've got proof that they did this maintenance, right? They've looked after that road. They've looked after this building. Okay. So if you can just get them to write a note on the time cut that they did X, Y, and Z, it will help. Good point, Drew. One of the other things I just want to say quick is to be sure, like immediately after a disaster, to push out to your citizens that they need to be taking pictures as well before they start cleaning up. So in Iowa, we're neighbor helping neighbor. Um, we got hit Friday night at about 5.30. I was at a farm at 7 a.m. the next morning to start doing damage assessment and you couldn't tell anything had happened already. They had neighbors had swooped in, metal was moved out, buildings were, you know, it was all in nice neat piles. So I'm trying to take pictures to show the state how damaged we are and you can't tell that anything happened. So um, just make sure, especially um, even your fire departments, once they've finished with all of the life safety stuff, I know Greeley Fire Department was completely instrumental in getting pictures for us. They went around to every address, helped get pictures. Um, one of the firefighters is also a teacher, so she had a Google Drive set up in each folder. It was amazing um, on my end to receive that information. So um, making contact with uh, your local people to um, definitely push messaging about taking pictures, and that will help their insurance costs yeah. as well. You know, when the insurance adjuster stops by and it looks like nothing happened, you need to have that documentation to be able to show them, no, this is what we did. Um, we all of that volunteer hours counts towards your insurance claims. So to make sure that they're 
documenting all of that, you know, saying we had 50 people here for four hours, then that's why it looks like nothing happened. Yeah, I agree. Um, so, okay, so EMAs, well, it's what happens after the PDA is done, right? EMAs provide information to the state. State works FEMA to actually validate, get a federal declaration, right? Once again, there's a statewide threshold. 5.6 May, basically, it's uh, an individual uh, $4.44. That's pretty much what the map works out to. Um, okay, so a presidential request is granted to the counties for the DMG decree, right? So if a presidential disaster declared, applicants can apply by through HSCD. So What's the reason I make that differentiation? Because as say Delaware has been included in the presidential declaration, but to be to not meet the threshold to be county, then guess what? Delaware is included, but to be county is not, or say Scott County, right? Scott County is included, but if Delaware did not meet the threshold, Delaware is not turned on for public assessments. So that declaration will actually list out the counties. That right? And it's important to report everything because you might be helping <clears throat> other counties. So when we had all the tornadoes roll through, we met our threshold just by a little smidge, but our meeting our threshold helped Washington and Johnson counties to boost theirs. And it all counts towards the state declaration. So um, every little thing is good to count. On, on top of that, whatever gets presidential declared, the, the funds, then kick in mitigation. Measures. We're going to talk about that. We've got to talk about So, here's the importance of how I can allocate it, how I can best assess my units, right? So, um, basically, as you know and you understand your jurisdiction better than anybody, you under, you, so you can find the county EMA, right? You're going to understand it. You're going to know the nuances better than I do and where the locations are, how that drainage occurs, right? So, um, some of the other things you can do is give proper training. Every time the EMAs put on a training for PDAs, make sure somebody of some level of decision making authority is at that training. Provide them sufficient resources. Make sure that it's iPhones. With picture capturing or, or iPad or something, make sure they are a sufficient resource to mail, right? Um, Can I do one more thing? Yeah, go ahead. If you turn on your GPS when you're taking the photo, most times, nine times out of 10, it'll put the GPS in that metadata of the photo so we know exactly where it is. So you don't have to write it down. And we'll also capture the date too. Yeah, turn that on. Thanks, man. Um, okay, so make sure that sometimes when you put together, when you identify your results to be collect the LDA information, the damage assessment, make sure you're not picking somebody who cannot commit to a short time frame. Your remainder, not going to do it, but volunteer position, because they probably form it on their different spots. At that time, they're answering questions from citizens. They're, you know, actually attending conferences or um, um, press conferences or whatever, right? So make it sure somebody can vote. Um, enable L LD teams that can make a conference of this, right? That know the entire breadth of the community. Uh, and that you want to make sure that you're able to maximize the federal and state resources. Okay, so this is what Graham was just talking about. So. All right, you can't see that graphic over there, right? But when a presidential disaster a declaration is made, right? It is made, the public assistance is made for the specified counties with damage. Hazard mitigation, 20% of all permanent work for PA is made available for all 99 counties, right? That is paramount. The reason I say that is paramount because these are actually, so if you remember that wheel we showed you 
resources or respond recovery response um, planning mitigation. This is the mitigation piece. This is funding for those mitigation measures to actually construct your potential to take a part to uh, purchase renewable sediments for real world sediments to purchase generators from your critical facilities. Right? This is how you do that. Okay, so when you like maybe say when you actually work to meet the state threshold, even if you don't think your county is going to meet this county threshold, all, all state threshold, this is turned on for all 99 counties. Okay, so for instance, oh, Western County in North of West Island, or the direction, they're on the direction, right? they weren't eligible for. Public assistance, however, because the entire state has threshold, they were one of the dynamic counties that was eligible for the mitigation grant. Right? We got that because we get the uh, presidential deck for public assistance, right? Next slide, please, Christine. You can just use it with these. Okay. okay. So, um, non PA I benefit. So, PA once again stands for public assistance, I individual assistance. Okay. So, one of the other non FEMA benefits is it identifies those areas that FEMA will not fund. Okay, so if it's on and venture collector or above as designated by the Iowa Department of Transportation, it's damaged, then it's part of the Federal Highway Emergency Relief Program, and it's not paid for by FEMA. They're thinking, why does that matter? Well, some of the roads in your jurisdictions are identified on that map, even though you may maintain it. Right? So you may think, well, hey, man, there's my road home, right? We maintain it. Well, I got and they say, yeah, but it's part of the federal housing classification system. It's a major collector model, right? So those things are so important because if it goes through the FEMA process, six months later or seven months later, you find out what's not eligible because it should, it's covered in this one, you may have missed the window for that, right? So um, go, go back. Right. So, also, local damage assessments can be shown kind of damage for other grant applications that I've talked about. And these are acronyms. Brick is better resiliency um, infrastructure, uh, building resilient infrastructure communities, right? Um, hazard mitigation is, is um, grant program, and then the flood mitigation program. Okay. So basically, all these, this one and the brick and the FMA are competitive, right? So this is the way you would work with your county MA and your local call as competitive grant applications, right? But conducting the LDAs can actually um, show where you need that money, show that you if there was a need, right? <clears throat> so okay. So typically, when a uh, federal declaration bank or assistance is uh, turned on, it's seventy-five percent federal funding, ten percent state funded. If you meet the couple of caveats, we'll get into in a second, and fifteen percent locally funded. Right. But what I want to encourage you all is to think about this. Right. Because you could you go back one slide. Think about this. This is a reinforcement program. So what Mandy said is very true. This is not usually at a time. You usually have to lay the funds out to get a back. Right? Okay. So once again, individual assistance. As Mandy said, this is really hard to get. Right? So even if it's at the state level, there's actually two, state and then federal. 200% of the federal property, right? Which is the majority of the homes 
or above that, right? Um, disaster case management is kind of is uh, built to build the gaps, right? But once again, it is a good. Then this is the thing. Okay, so FEMA, right? So a declaration is requested by our office, HSMD, for individual assistance with a federal program. If it is made and it's granted for those counties, the state individual assessment program ends and the federal picks up, right? So, well, once again, I think this is the biggest caveat, not covered by insurance, right? Not covered by insurance. It's for individual damage, not covered by insurance, right? And it can include things such as uh, personal items, furniture, clothing. Okay. How we do it on time? Okay, good. Ten minutes. Okay. So how do I apply? How do I get money for a VA? Well, you do it um, through what's called the RV. It's request for public assistance. It's basically a pretty easy form that you fill out. And the reason I want to make sure you guys get this is so you can have these outlines, right? So pretty much it's a, a broad questionnaire where you give some preliminary uh, kind of information about you, about your, your um, city, about your municipality, your dons number, those kind of things, right? And you submit them to our Homeland Security and Emergency Managers um, website right there. Okay, so basically, all uh, that is good. All of those do. FEMA looks at it, says, okay, what's the next step? Fund agreement. Fund agreement has to be completed for each entity. So for your city, you have to actually have a fund agreement signed, and it has to be in our version of our pretty much our credit kind of tracking website for you, the city, to get funds. If you don't, if you don't have this, it doesn't matter how many items you got done, how many you got funded by FEMA, all the funds going to go through us. We're not going to give you any money for that, right? This has to be done before you, right? And actually, it has to be designated. You have to designate who's every your city or authority, your authorized agent for each city, and your financial officer, right? That's why. So basically, FEMA is very <coughs> high, now, right? They're going to write out a project. They're going to obligate projects. The state, we actually administer the program, right? We give you technical advice. Remember, they don't drive it. We don't drive it. You drive it, right? So what I mean by that is if FEMA says, oh, we need to have this meeting at this time, well, we need to do a um, side spot and stuff. You can actually think, no, I can't make it. We can't see the damage because guess what? There's snow on the ground. How are you going to see damage to actually do a side inspection? Right, so we disperse funds, we monitor, right? We make sure that all your, your documents are good. We make sure that, you know, you are uh, aware of everything going on, but pretty much when all of it comes back to you, you're responsible, right? Okay, so what we look at is when we look at public uh, assistance, we look at kind of the eligibility paragraph. Are you an eligible? Yeah, true in the city. Are you in a county that was collected for you? Is it facility eligible? Did you own it? Right? Was it an active use of the time? A zero plan, a water plan, you know, a city hall? Was it work? Was it Was it reasonable? I mean, was a nice person. Uh, and the cost. Really so the cost we don't. Did it trickle back to the eligible work? To your eligible facility and your eligible applicant. Mm -hmm. um, once again, applicant eligibility, I'm not going to bore you with these guys, but once again, right there, it says the municipal of government, right? And what I, the other thing I want to point out to you certain private nonprofits, right? So you're going to have a lot of those in your, in your uh, municipality, whether it be houses of worship, whether it be uh, uh, nursing homes. 
whether it be uh, hospitals. So facility building, right? Gender as a result of disaster, uh, you have the legal responsibility. Active at the time of success, right? And it's not under another authority. But what I mean, it's not under the purview of the federal highway, or it's not a levy as the responsibility of the Corps of Engineers or NRCS. Okay, so we're good. FEMA likes to say it's got two categories or two uh, pyramids or two thoughts of work, right? Temporary work, which you call it to removal, and then we'll take protective measures, which is like response, search and rescue, debris removal, and it's got what it terms as permanent work. Category CTG, which is uh, roads and bridges, uh, water control facilities, such as drainage and ditches, uh, public buildings, sea calls. Um, counter analysis, how would you it, which would be your water lines, your sewer lines, your lift stations, and then parks and rack and other facilities, right? Other facilities would be like your um, bus depot or your airports, right? So, call shows is it nasty or scary or reasonable? Well, let's go back to this. I change you how big it is, reasonable, right? So, if you're just, if it's not in an emergency situation, right? And to make sure it's reasonable, God, it's get to the door, right? That way you can show, hey, all the costs are reasonable. Like if it's a thousand dollar item, I got three quotes, even if it's something I'm looking online for not, right? We're gonna buy something for not, okay? I'm just going along getting other. I don't know, whatever that is, you know, deep bone box. Just show that's within uh, reasonable box, right? Um, consistent with the applicants, applicants, general policy procedures. Okay, your procurement policy. Everything in here, whether it's contract, whether it's you procurement services, no matter what, if it's not aligned with your procurement policy, if you grant the further work, you run the risk of losing. On, on that one thing, if you've got an emergency clause in your procurement policy, or if you don't, I'd recommend putting one in. <clears throat> um, that allows you to, like, go, um, okay, I need a plumber here now, not in three weeks after getting 12 quotes, right? Or something else, so, and a debris, right? I've got a farmer who's got a final loader right in the street. I just need the debris to move the street. If you have that emergency clause, you don't have to go through, but you also yeah. want to include emergency or uh, oxygen, right? So, what it may mean, there would be one qualified funeral. I'll give you guys a good example. Um, Eastern Iowa Airport, right? And it's Teeter Um, you, you have to have a FAA approved contractor to come repair fencing, right? That set that kind of fence in the airport. Well, they had to do it within so many hours or they couldn't conduct flight or flight. So they had somebody out there, there was only one person that was close by within like a, somebody on a track that could do the work. Once again, that's the exigent, right? That's something um, of an unusual kind of circumstance, right? So include that in one grant. Thank you. Special thoughts requirements, okay? Those standards. So anything you're building back today needs to include closed standards, right? In repair. So these aren't just adopted code standards. These are industry accepted code standards, right? But you always, if you they are industry wide accepted code standard, you want to list where we're from, right? Could be um, something from the concrete industry, the American Center of Welding. Could be something from the um, Association of Civil Engineers, right? Um, and it has to be reasonable, right? Once again, it can be sent to a little bit. Um, and that's consistent. Sorry. But if you're a special things that you normally do, or special things that you require, if it's not a formally adopted, not yours, but wide, 
you know, in your municipality, then it can't be funded, right? And the last, if there's one of these things in here, that best practices that is accepted in the right? Okay. I'm going to bore you a little bit of 406 medication, right? Thanks to work for basically medication. So your repair facility, you want to make it toward does it get damaged? It's resilient, right? Make sure include that as much as you can, right? But it needs to be cost effective, right? Or if it's not cost effective, don't let the even tell you it's not possible, right? Remember, this is your grant. You drive the bus, right? You call me, call Graham, call Sarah, call Jill. Okay, we're gonna help you out. That's what we're here for. Right? We're here to serve because guess what? I'm gonna see you, 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 everybody. I have you, right? I'm gonna see you fairly. I'm gonna walk well, even they come and go, and we're we're neighbor, right? <laughs> no, do not leave this out. And if you have any questions about 406 mitigation, right? It's actually the reason it's important is because it's not competitive. It's actually part of your repair of the damage or something. It's the added allergic portion that mitigates from future damages. Okay. This is non competitive. Now, the costs are still applied, and there is an effort out there to make it to where there is no cost share associated with the additional monies. For medication that's tied on to the PA. Okay. So if you remember, PA is at 75 um, from the Fed, 10 by the state, 15 by local. You extrapolate that on the uh, 406 medication you have on, right? There is a push out there at the federal level to make that 100% over time, right? To make it to where there is no additional policy you add on. That makes sense, right? And if you have questions, please let me know. Okay, so environmental stroke preservation, right? Anything you do, don't do it without permission. If I could tell you anything, it'd be, if, if you actually go, if you dig a hole, it needs to be cleared first. If you're repairing anything, it needs to be cleared first by the beam, right? And if you discover something out there, um, say you discover human remains or discover pottery or anything like that, you let HSMD know as quick as possible. And if you discover like human remains, probably the police department right away. Right? Even if it's like um, something, when I say human remains, these you surprise how many burial sites we have in Iowa, all right? Um, but you also want to give the police problems the ability to say no. I know we talked about that, but You'd be surprised, right? And okay. so anytime we put, you can't say, oh, I can't tell you how much time that's right here causing you the delay of funding or people to get back on. So debris, when the first thing you're probably going to end up doing is search and rescue. The next thing you're going to do is clear out the debris, right? Debris, when you place that somewhere, make sure that it's somewhere that's been disturbed before. A gravel, Pad, a concrete pad, close off a road and stick it all on a road. Don't go put it in a farmer's field. No. That will get you in trouble. Sorry. Stick it somewhere that's already being disturbed. Because they're going to, Chimbo is going to save that time to stuff. Chimbo is a fate to your state of sort of preservation office, right? Out of the way. They're going to say a farmer's field is not disturbed. How is it? You're crazy. It's been till. Do you know how, do you know how deep a death can go? Right? They're going to say it's not. But Graham Saint is very, very valid. So in this case, if you have a community park, close out the parking lot. Put the debris there for a timber reduction to check. Right? I can tell you that with the great show, millions of millions of dollars still being held up because they put on farmers' fields. What about like a compost area where your city takes it? If it's prescribed that you normally use, then it should be okay. Okay. Sometimes so. And I think what Graham was alluding to, sometimes it may be so funny, right? Like the derecho where it all couldn't go there, right? You had to have any reduced before it could even go there, right? Or you even take to the city department or you know, the chili, 
So the DNR too is working on a pilot program with Black Hawk County right now, and then it's going to be rolled out probably statewide where they're going to come in and help pre identify sites mm -hmm. so that you'll have an idea ahead of the disaster where you can go with things. So be looking for information from your EMAs on that, I would say in the next year or so. Guess it's working. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you know, right? So Anytime there is waterway damage or debris and waterway, hey, contact the UNR, contact the board. Here's another good example. City of Sierra Rapids, City of Marion. They had some uh, debris that fell in the waterway. Okay, typically not an issue, but it's behind homes, right? And because it, it, could, uh, it was fell in the waterway, it could actually cause ponding and cause them to be flood out. So here's where they have to go through NRCS and get the non NRCS before they put it through the FEMA. If they had missed that window through NRCS, they would not want because FEMA said, what is it? Did you actually go to NRCS and ask first? So little things like that, make sure you communicate with the EME coordinator. And I guarantee you, if your EME has coordinator has a question, they can ask a question, they're going to call us. Okay, there are certain things where we do this every day. She does this every day. I don't expect you guys to memorize or I remember a hundred things, right? So on these, when it comes to anything in a waterway or woman, it requires a response from DNR and the core both. And even if it's just email saying they're good, they must touch her. Okay, and guess what? We're not going to send any, it's not HSMD. It's who's the app who's going to answer across that from DNR and the corner. Insurance, right? So you have to have the insurance. FEMA reduces the amount by whatever the actual proceeds are. And if you don't have insurance on that building or that structure and they fund it, guess what? They're going to require you to get insurance on that facility in order for them to give you funding. Okay? So, that doesn't mean like uh, lift stations, that doesn't mean roads, but they're talking about structures that typically have insurance, such as your city hall, your public works building, you know, your uh, power pavilion, right? And those kind of things. Okay, so remember how we said to give it a 10% take share, you have to meet a certain amount of caveats. If it's a flood cause incident, you have to participate or your county has to participate in the National Flood Insurance Program. If you don't, if it's a flood incident, you're not much more for that state 10% insurance, right? It has to have also a emergency response plan for your county. <clears throat> and I do believe all nine of the counties are on that, right? So you're good there. But the NFIP, you want to go back and make sure your community is participating in the National Flood Insurance Program. Because if it's a flood panel, you're not much more fat, two percent. Now you may think not a big deal, but guess what? That two percent can mean the difference of a thousand bucks can mean the difference of two hundred thousand bucks, right? Chris, one more minute. Okay. Sorry. No, you're fine. So our partner work, let's get insurance got acquired for a thousand thousand bucks or less. Okay, grand major required. Duplication benefits is not enough. So basically, if you have insurance proceeds, you're not going to get anything from me. Okay? But <clears throat> procurement contracting, document, document, document. I, if, I, if you don't take anything else away from there, for all of your grants, all your contracts, document everything. Procurement, everything. Record keeping. So FEMA says basically three years from your last federal financial report, you have to have records. And the last year, jurisdiction said longer. Some grants require five years, some seven. So your jurisdiction may have a longer retention fee. Okay. All right, some findings, common findings, unreasonable, <clears throat> missing documentation. Additional community resources, SBA, uh, Federal Highway, USDA. And then basically everything in this presentation 
as of these resources. Okay, and so here's the reason I want to make sure you guys have a copy of this too. How what is that? These sound like these. Use me as a resources. I've worked with students before. I'm an actually certified sort of room player. I still maintain my ACP. So easy. I mean, I know the girls you got. Right? For our budgeting to capital improvement program to conference plans. Everything. So, and I think that is it. So thank you guys. Please, if you have any questions, reach out to you. Okay? Don't be afraid to reach out to your academy you may, right? Okay. I established that relationship with them now during work discuss. And these are hard programs to navigate, even just getting grants for mitigation stuff. So definitely your county EMA is your partner in this. We will help you through the process, even if it's just showing you how to navigate the system, like technically through the, the grant system. It's, it's not very user friendly. So um, we work in it every day and we're happy to help you guys. A lot of information. I know. <laughs> Should I have a day session for you guys? Well, we can always not only can we come back, we can always do a, something on virtual. So I mean, to me, if there was plenty, I just don't want to check it out, just guys. Right. So and go fill the that. You have to help. Right. Um, if you guys want more training in this, we can work on getting, there's a FEMA class that will come in and do exercises on what your local role is. You can get your mayor and everybody there actually talk through how you would respond to a disaster. And then at the end of June in Delaware County, we're hosting a volunteer and donations management class. I'll send that link to Marla to send out too, because when things happen, you will start receiving everybody's goodwill donations. Mm -hmm. show so how to manage that and how to manage your volunteers that show up to help you. So can anybody go to that? Honey? Yep, I'll send it out. All right. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so my name is Alex Banky. I'm the owner of Open Geo. And then we have Joey Myers here. Um, and we'll be presenting today on what's called GIS services or geographic information systems. Um, so we've been going around the state and kind of presenting councils and uh, marriage meetings and showing people what we can offer cities and how you guys can use GIS to kind of, um, you know, help with your city workflow. Um, so quick background on each of us. So for me, uh, I graduated from the University of Iowa. I worked for the city of Iowa City while I was at uh, school there and as a GIS analyst for them. And I also worked for the Metropolitan Planning Organization of Johnson County. Um, I graduated school and then worked, with, worked in an engineering company and about a year and a half ago, I decided to start this company to help uh, small towns that don't necessarily have the budget to hire somebody to do this internally. So I'm hoping that kind of helps small towns with this. And I, I'm Joey. I also graduated from the University of Iowa in 2019 with an enterprise leadership degree. And then after college, I went to work in the solar industry um, where I was installing the foreman for a couple of years before joining Alex when he started the company in 2021. So you may be familiar with GIS or geographic information systems. Um, you may not be. So if you have never heard of it, it's like it's a geographic information systems, basically a digital database, uh, a digital map that can store data or photos or uh, documents, and you can access uh, all through like a cloud server. Um, so like I said, today we'll just be showing some examples. Um, feel free to throw out any questions as we're going through. Um, and we'll get started here. So the first one is Luxembourg here. Um, so last year we did go and map their water infrastructure for them. This is typically uh, a great, I guess, first step in the GIS for communities. It's a natural first step to kind of map their water infrastructure. So what we're looking at here is their site hub page, what it's called. Um, so if they ever in the future want to map more items in their town, this is where they access any and all GIS information. Um, so I'll just go to the utilities tab here. And what you'll see is we have their all water infrastructure, their clean water infrastructure, sanitary sewer and storm water. Um, so if they click on any of these tabs, it'll take them to either a web application or a dashboard. Uh, what we're looking at here is a web app. So this is showing all their water infrastructure. If I zoom in, you'll actually see the points on the map, uh, everything that we went in and mapped for them. Um, 
it's it's got a lot of nice little widgets so you could uh, draw on here you can mark it up or circle something and take a screenshot or print it and send it to an engineering company if you need to you can take measurements um you know like i said a few little widgets if you click on a point it will give you details on that point so uh, you know this is just kind of the data that we collected you could always add uh, maybe inspection data or you know new photos if you need to like this one does have a photo attached with it um so that can kind of serve as a reference as to where that point actually is um especially if it's buried you know if this is a helpful tool to be able to find that and we would know how deep it was if if it was buried. Um, the next thing I'll show you here is the dashboard. Um, so this is the sanitary sewer one. And up at the top, there are filters. So if you're looking for a specific ID, uh, this case will say point number 11. We're looking for manual 11. If I click that, it zooms in on the map and shows me right where that is. Um, you can search by. Can yeah, go for it. Um, uh, people on Zoom can't see this. Oh, can they not? Oh, we'll share it. Uh, um, we did stop the share before. Oh, right. They were very. Yeah, we want them to start over. We want them to start over. Yes. Go over it before. Then, I'm pretty sure this is Oops, yeah, I should have checked that. Okay, hopefully everybody's seen that now. Um, I can share the thing. Yeah. Uh, so, as I was saying, this is the operations dashboard that they can view. Um, so, if you wanted to say you had a project on a specific street, you could filter by that street. Uh, and in this instance, we'll use Church Street. So, what it will do is it'll zoom in the Church Street, filter anything else off the map, and it shows me, okay, there's six manholes here. Um, so, that can be a great tool if you're maybe have a meeting with an engineering company. Um, you can kind of show them what you're looking at there. Um, and then you'll also notice on the left side of the screen, there's hyperlinks. So what these are actually linking to are the digital plat maps, the paper plat maps that we want to digitize for them. Um, so this is pretty useful. Rather than digging through a bunch of paper plat maps, you can just click on the point on the map and have pretty easy access there. Um, from here, you can print, you can save it, you can email it, uh, whatever you might need to do. Um, so that's kind of it for the water infrastructure. If anybody has any questions, like I said, feel free to, to shout them out. Otherwise, we'll go on to the next example here. Um, and and this in this example, we are using uh, Luxembourg data that we did map for them. Uh, and this is what's called augmented reality. So this is kind of a, a newer technology, something to look for in the future. But uh, I'll just play this video here. So. What we're looking at is the person in the field is looking at their phone. And as we zoom in here, uh, you'll see this is actually what the person is seeing on their phone. Um, so they can kind of move around with their phone and look at things and it'll point out, you know, that's a, that's a water line and, and that's a service valve. Um, so this is just something that I like to show as a new and upcoming technology, um, kind of the next tier after uh, mapping with GIS. Another thing I'd like to show is with GIS, you can do reporting and you can do work order requests and, and things like that. So in this example, I'm can gonna you show- Can expand your screen? What was that? Um, can you just expand your yeah. screen? Is that a little, little um, better? Like, I think if you hit that time, it should go full screen too. Like on the, uh, sure when I see. Why not you want to? There's an browser there. I think you just have to increase the most of it. Can you do that? That's time to expand the whole browser. Don't do control or something. No, it's already maximized. So I think it's just still showing the address bar. Can you move the uh, sharing up there? Switch that out. And then go to three dots. There's like a so there you go. That'll work. I don't know that's what it was, not at 10. I bet. Yeah, that's a little better there. Um, so on this map, we're looking at uh, Holy Cross's uh, fire hydrants, and this is an example of how you can use this to <coughs> inspections and, and maintenance requests. So if I actually click on one of these, it will 
the pop pop up here. So, like I said, you can see the photos or any details with that. And then there's this link here that you can do for hydrant inspection form. Um, Well, I guess basically that would take you to a little survey that you can fill out and, uh, you know, you can answer any questions, take any notes, uh, maybe put a date that this was maintained on this date and uh, any other notes or photos you want to attach with that. If you made F11, that'll bring you out of that. It, it, it's all right. I, I okay. It's okay there. But, um, so, and, and then with the system, we can make it automatically generate a report so this would be like the report after that inspection was completed you know like i said it gives you a date the notes it says the hydrant paint is good um so just a, a really neat tool to track maintenance and inspections um and then another example here would be if i say you get a call a city clerk or city admin gets a call there's a manhole that's broken or, or what have you um you could click on a point and then do kind of the same thing. It has a link where it says, I want to submit uh, action request or um, you know, work order. And so there's the link right there. Take you to a quick form where you fill out, you know, maybe the resident said this thing is broken or it's missing. And we can actually design it where it'll send a text or an email to the public works employee that needs to fix that. And then um, in, in communications with some of the cities that we work with or we're trying to work with, um, we learned about the lead service line inventory that's due October 16th of next year. And there's kind of a sense of unknowing and they don't really know a lot about it. So we met with the DNR and we designed a survey um, that takes all the elements from the DNR spreadsheet here that I'm sure a lot of you have seen. And our survey is just, you um, You just select the address of the residence. And then from there you select, you, you just select the, uh, the ownership of the service line and answer the questions corresponding with the, uh, with the service line inventory. And every time you, hit submit on the survey, it'll drop a point on this tracking map that we have generated. And it helps you keep track of, you know, which residences you've been to, um, which ones still need to be done. And uh, the nice thing about this survey is that it can be sent out to the public. So we actually did it for Holy Cross and their plan is to, I believe, send it out to the public, see what kind of response they get from that. And then from there, they will, you know, the public works guy or whoever will go out and collect the rest of the data. And then once all the data is collected, we're able to export it and plug it into the DNR spreadsheet for you. So that way, you, you know, you really don't have to fiddle around with the, the spreadsheet because that can, spreadsheets can become a lot, so. <clears throat> and we've actually timed this. This makes, this process makes it about three times faster for the data collection rather than using that spreadsheet. And, and sending it out to the public is a huge bonus to there because you know, whether or not everybody fills it out, you know, it's probably not going to be a hundred percent rating, but even if you get 10% of the houses that filled out, that's 10% of places that your public works person doesn't have to physically go to to do this inspection. And then how it helps, like we were talking about, just easier means of data collection. It makes it much faster. Um, you don't have to mess around with the spreadsheet. And then you get to see on the uh, progress map how it's coming along. Um, and that map would be yours to keep after the survey was completed. And, well. and the map could be handy for in the future. The DNR didn't confirm this, but they hinted that the EPA at some point might require it. So you can have unknowns with this survey. You can submit things like if you don't know it, you can submit unknowns. Um, they said the EPA might suggest that, or require, I should say, you know, maybe in three years you have to figure out what 5% of these unknowns are. And that's where the map would come in really handy. You could say, okay, here's uh, neighborhood where there's a lot of unknowns. So let's focus on that this year. And then the next year, we can focus on a different part. Yeah, and the next thing we'll talk about is our cemetery mapping platform. And I know not all cities own their cemeteries, but uh, some do, and we've gotten some good interest on this. So what you're looking at here is the aerial view from the cemetery. And as it zooms in, you'll see a bunch of points on the map. And those all represent a burial or a plot 
Um, so when Alex clicks on one, it pulls up all the information um, <coughs> on the headstone as well as photos of the front and the back if there's anything on the back. You can click on the photos, make them larger. Um, and then um, once Alex gets back to their site and take you right to it on where it is on the map. So that's a useful tool for cemetery staff. Um, this will be available to the public as well. So if somebody's looking for a loved one, a friend, uh, they can do it that way. And uh, we also added military branch and war name filters up at the top. So if it's indicated anywhere on the burial that the person served, um, you can, for instance, click on Army and it'll filter all the people that are buried there that served in the Army. And same same works with uh, the war name one. We got all the wars listed there. You can see all the Vietnam vets buried there, for instance, and then it pulled up them and you can visit their sites as well. And as you said, this is available to public. We could make a little QR code that you could post in the cemetery and uh, residents could come in and scan that and get access to this. Um, I have thought of ways to monetize this and maybe you can make a little bit of monthly income from it here. So maybe you could get some sponsors like the funeral homes or maybe a flower shop or any other local residents. So you could put a sponsorship on there and maybe they could pay, uh, you know, uh, monthly fee or something. And then we've also received interest about more of a like a true cemetery walk down. So what we have here is um, you can actually navigate the cemetery with the arrows on the map. And so it's more like you're actually there. Um, you know, if, if you if you don't live in near the cemetery and you want to visit somebody again, this is a good way to be able to do that. Okay, and then one other thing we like to show is that we do have a drone. Um, so we like to show a couple of ways that we can uh, utilize that technology. So here are a couple of pictures of Holy Cross. These are just regular photos, um, but we could take photography for your town. Uh, another option with this is 360 degree panorama imagery, kind of like what we just saw in the cemetery there. Uh, this image could be linked to your city's website so the public could view this. Um, just be a unique view of the town. Basically, you can do multiple of these across the town. Uh, here's the aerial ortho imagery. So what that means is basically the uh, bird's eye view looking down on the earth. And what we're showing here is the difference between the drone image and what you'd see on Google Earth. So the left is what we captured with the drone, and the right is the uh, Google Earth aerial imagery. So it's night and day difference there. Um, pretty pretty crazy how much that differs. Um, in this example, this is Holy Cross. Uh, they recently put in solar by their water tower. You can see it up on the top left of that image. So the mayor had requested that we basically document. You can see the underground uh, electric running through this overhead pole. Uh, so now they have this image of exactly where that's at. So in a year or two, when the grass grows back, they can refer to this and see right where that is. Um, so using GIS, we are able to geo-reference that on the map. And then we did draw in uh, the line on the map exactly where that is. And that kind of integrates with their, they have their overhead uh, utilities map as well. So that's another thing we can add to the system if your city owns their own electric. Um, that would be a great way we document disconnect switches and overhead power transformers. Uh, so if there's ever an emergency, you would know exactly where uh, if you shut off power basically which homes would be without power and then this is just showing another way that gis can be utilized this is ada uh, curb ramp and compliance check and then sidewalk mapping uh so in the video is they're kind of moving around there kind of the same as before if you click on the point it gives you any details regarding that point any photos um, you know, there's a lot of information that can track with compliance checks for ADA compliance and all that can be stored in here. Um, so again, just another way of showing how GIS can be used. 
Um, I even thought of another way in that last presentation, they were talking about how you need the GPS coordinates for uh, disaster relief, and you could use GIS for that as well, where you, we can make a map for the public where if there is an emergency, um, you know, they could put a point on the map, take the pictures that they need, and you wouldn't necessarily have to send somebody out there to do it. So um, lots of ways that GIS can be used. The, the sky is the one right there. Um, so kind of wrapping up here, uh, why work with us? So we are local. Uh, we're both from Holy Cross. Um, uh, Joey lives in Iowa City. I live in Moyne right now, but uh, so we do cover a wide area, but we are pretty frequently back in the area here. Um, we do offer a great product. I'll let Joey kind of talk about some of these examples here. So in communications with other towns, we whether we ended up getting them as a client or not, we sort of seeing what they're paying for the services that we would we would offer. And um, of some of them that decided to not go with us, you can see their potential savings up here. Um, so this, this city was population 763. They were paying an engineering company to have their water infrastructure map. And they ended up paying 40,000. And what we quoted them was about 20 to 25,000. So they could, you know, there's a great potential for savings, um, especially, going with us uh, we're a smaller company as opposed to an engineering company so our overhead is obviously much lower so that that's a big help and then um, city c down there they were seeking to have their cemetery mapped and we quoted them at about eleven thousand six hundred, and they actually decided to go for it themselves and they paid ended up paying eighteen thousand just for a gps unit alone um, whereas when we do the cemetery we may not even necessarily need a gps unit to do it and so that's just a couple of examples of the save potential savings. We are flexible to fit in your budget. So we are aware that you know there's different budgets for different things. Uh, one community we're talking with right now, they want their gas, electric, water, sanitary, they want everything, but they don't know if they're ready to go all in yet. So we're flexible in the aspect of well, if they have the funds for the water to be mapped, you know, we can do that first. And um, we are flexible also in a way that. If, if we're too expensive to physically come out and map it for you, we can set up the software for you and you could internally map it yourself. We train you, um, there'd be cost savings for you as, as well there. Um, or you could have your public works people do it. So um, keep that in mind. Um, you know, with GIS, you're going to save a lot of time, especially for future and new employees or council members. Um, so I'm sure some of you know the growing pains. Uh, when you add a new person, they might not have a good idea where your water infrastructure is. So imagine if they had a tool like this to use, um, you know, searching through paper plat maps, of course, that can be pretty time consuming. Um, and, you know, time is money, so you're going to save money. Uh, and then this is a big le legacy item. So, like I said, kind of planning for the future, who are the council members going to be or who are the new employees going to be? This is really setting them up for success. Um, because once those new people get on board, they'll have this tool, everything will be documented. Um, and then the data security, so this is all cloud-based. Uh, we had a meeting yesterday, they do have a little bit of GIS at their town, but it's all internally stored on a local computer. So if something ever happens to that computer, their data is just gone. So this is cloud-based, you know, you can't really lose it and that's very secure. Um, but yeah, that's about it for today. Um, I hope you guys learned and thought this was interesting. Um, Alex, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, I see all the, we can't see the slides. <laughs> uh, okay. Does each module have separate price? For example, so much for water, sewer, and cemetery. Uh, yes, yeah, so each one would be priced differently. Um, you know, it's all dependent on the specific town and you know how big the cemetery is, or how many manholes they have, or um, you know, it really depends on the town and uh, kind of what they have. So it does vary, and it, it, there would be a price for each uh, each one there. Uh, so, is there a cost savings if we have most of the data? Uh, absolutely. So depending on the form of your data or, or what file type it's in, um, we've had a few places where they 
maybe had some other company do it previously and they think our platform looks a little more easy to use or intuitive, um, we can certainly kind of transfer that over and um, you know put that in our system. So that's definitely a possibility there. I think I asked this before, but like we um, we have to do a sign inventory, um, and we we have a separate software that we do that. But that's a layer that could be set up under your yeah. um, under your program, and we, we could train an employee to go out and mm -hmm. take a photo of that sign. And yeah, absolutely. Kind of like I was saying before, we don't physically have to come and map everything. Yeah. Um, we can just set it up for you, and then maybe have a little training session. Make sure whoever's collecting the data okay. knows how to properly collect the data, and then. Okay. Um, yeah, and then you can kind of take it from there. Perfect. All right. Well, if you think of any other questions later down the road, uh, on the back of the brochures, you have our contact info. There is a QR code on there. You can scan that. will take you to the website so you can see some more examples if you want to. Um, oh, we just got another question. Is there yearly maintenance cost? Um, that's a good question. So there is an annual fee. It's dependent on uh, kind of if you want to be able to edit the data or if you want to be able to just view it. Um, so like I know in Luxembourg's case, you guys are just viewing it. Um, so we charge, it's just $150 a year for the viewer uh, fee. And then for the, an editor, if you want to actually edit the data, that'd be about four fifty dollars a year for that. So. Do I make it public facing too if there's some things we want the public to see? Yep, absolutely. So depending on what well, you can make it all public facing if you wanted to, um, it's all up to you. So okay. um, like we mentioned, the cemetery, typically that'd be one you yeah. want to make public uh, the water yeah. the church, if you choose to. You, and you can kind of pick what they see, like if there's certain uh, attributes within, you know, data within it that maybe you want them to see, but other things you don't yeah. want them, you can kind of hide things. Like, <laughs> you want it to show and okay. yeah okay well thank you very much we appreciate the time um like i said if you have any other questions feel free to call us or email us at any time thank you thank you Do that one last. Okay. <laughs> I know that's going to take up most of the conversation. Yeah. All right. You guys ready? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Is that really wrong, Mickey? Sorry. I mean, Mickey Shields, I will make his videos. I know some people really well. Mother of Like, oh, I know some of you. Stop any me. And I thought, I thought, I'm sure it was Trish. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Uh, it is great to see you <laughs> and meet some of you today. After. So, uh, we're going to talk legislative that now that the session's completed. So, we can really just say as a recap rather than an update. Um, I am going to say property taxes to the end. So, hold your questions on that. I know that's the number one issue. For all of our cities, but especially city clerks and finance officers, city managers that are expected to handle city budget each year. Um, so that's going to be by far and away the most impactful legislation that for cities that occurred this past session. There were some other things that we do need to talk about as well. Linda asked me about youth labor. Um, the laws have changed on that yesterday. So I definitely uh, put that a little higher on the list because it's, it's potentially impactful. Um, so there's a handful of things that are probably will stand out a little bit above every session. There's a bunch of issues that are maybe a little bit less impactful to all of our membership. Just note that our new laws of, of, of interest report will go out um, hopefully in June uh, next month uh, from our legislative team. They'll run down everything, every bill that really affects city government, even the small stuff. So look for that uh, again, typically um, in June mid-June, mid-late June, we get that out to the, uh, all the membership. Um, we do that in our uh, July magazine as well as an insert, but it'll be online, special report. Uh, we're gonna do a couple of webinars too on property taxes, probably a few, once we know a few more details. So, so when I get to that, sorry. When I get to that one, just remember that as well, because we won't have enough time to go through every single detail today. 
there's also some questions on some of the law itself that we're trying to sort out with like Ted Nelson, some of the mechanics of it. So I'll get to that later as well. Uh, so the things that did pass, I broke these up into two sections. Uh, it's not comprehensive. These are the big ones. Um, both it did get passed, but also things that were introduced this year that did, that did not, some of which will for sure come back next session. Okay, they just basically ran out of momentum this year, ran out of patience with each other uh, at the cap. But we know that they were either very close to being adopted this year or then we've been told they're definitely being brought back next year. So the things that did pass, again, skipping past property taxes for now, youth labor laws, you probably saw this in the news. Um, most of it really wasn't relevant to us. Uh, the big push on this was probably from the hospitality and restaurant industry uh, that wanted to be able to employ more teenage workers. Um, that was really where that came from. But obviously, in city government, you all, most cities, anyways, have seasonal employees that are teenagers, um, 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds that do mowing and lifeguarding and other types of things. So again, most for the most part, seasonal stuff, library folks, um, part time employees typically that you utilize throughout uh, the year, but really in the summer months. Um, the changes here, I'll go through them, but there's going to be a big asterisk to all of this, and I'll tell you why in a second. But first of all, uh, the probably most important thing that um, the big change would be 14 and 15 year olds can work longer hours in a day and in a week. Okay. And there's a difference between school time and non school time. And currently, the law has been basically during school year, school calendar, they, um, 14 and 15 year olds can work, I believe it is 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. That's the time frame, but it's also no more than four hours in a day. This will change that to um, not, uh, 11 p.m. Let me get that right. Yeah, 11 p.m. and they can work up to six hours per day. And then in a non-school year, they can go up to eight hours per day and no more than 40 hours in a week. Okay, so that's a somewhat of a significant change uh, just in the allowed amount of time they can work per day and per week for those uh, 14 and 15 year olds. Um, it also opens up 16 and 17 year olds to work the same amount of hours as 18 year olds, which is unlimited. Um, and that's always been the case. Uh, so 16 and 17 year olds also have some restrictions on their hours related to school again, uh, but that opens it up. Uh, the other thing is it expands the type of jobs that teenage employees can do. A lot of you know probably that you can't do um, hazardous, hazardous jobs as teenagers. Now for cities, a lot of the stuff that they opened up doesn't really apply. Uh, a lot of that power equipment, uh, heavy machinery uh, uh, restrictions that are already in place are still remain in place. Again, most of that stuff, what types of jobs was more for the restaurant in industry, um, serving alcohol. Now, I know some cities have uh, golf uh, course clubhouses and stuff. Uh, so that's potentially an issue or a possibility for your teenage staff, um, depending on what you all do. But here comes the big asterisk. There's two big asterisks to that, actually. First of all, the U.S. Department of Labor, this, these, some of these conflict directly with what the U.S. Department of Labor has in place, particularly the number of hours 14 and 15 year olds can work per day and per week. So I, I would, I think I'm not, you know, I'm not a labor law expert by any means, but a lot of folks in that world have, expect this to be contested in court. Um, based on that singular issue right there. It's in conflict with federal law, which typically federal law supersedes state law, which supersedes city law. And so it seems to be there's a conflict right there off the bat. Um, so that may have to be resolved in court. The other thing is liability in workers' comp. Um, you all, of course, are governed by that in the sense that you need coverage for all of your staff, whether they're full-time, uh, adult, quote unquote, uh, or part time teenagers, uh, employees, you have to cover them. And I could see some situations where liability and workers' comp providers are not willing to cover a 14 or 15 year old serving alcohol in a golf, city golf course clubhouse uh, or working until 11 o'clock at night, um, those types of issues. Uh, so that's another part to this. Even if the law does hold up, let's say it does go to court, it does get held, it does hold up. Um, I still see some cities having issues, uh, or I should say insurance providers having issues with those types of employees doing some of these types of activities uh, or working late at night. Uh, so this one 
is it passed, so it's there. It's effective July one. But I think again, because of those issues I just raised, I will have to wait and see just how this plays out for us at the city government level. Questions? Mostly answer what you're <laughs> looking for. So well, we still have to the work permit and stuff like that. You're supposed to get the fourteen mil. We'll still have to. That's do right. That. Yes, all of that stuff. Basically, the law didn't change. Um, refers it all to the. Uh, I was <laughs> development where they handle all the permitting. Uh, so I don't think anything, the law itself did not affect that. Those have always been a subject, subject, subject to administrative rules. Basically, the commissioner of the by workforce development, they have a youth labor division. Um, they can adopt rules. Now, they may have to amend rules because of this new law, but the permitting doesn't get affected by the, the code changes itself. So you still have to go through that process. Uh, the other one that came up was like driver's permits for certain types of employees. I would imagine that hasn't been changed as well. Um, we'll see. Other questions there? Good one. So then the trickier part too is like, obviously most of you, are, are you done with your, or getting close to being done with your seasonal staff hires and stuff? Probably. So this law is gonna be in the middle of summer. It goes into effect like how does that play out i don't know my my expectation is most cities will just dump them, do what they've done in the past and then maybe adjust for next season i could see that but hard to say um uh, the next one down state government consolidation now most of this is not really relevant to us another big kind of caveat to that though is what would potentially do to all the different programs uh, funding that uh, is directly impactful to cities. So the two that come to mind for sure, IEDA and the DNR. A uh, lot of interaction with uh, city government, with those two agencies, um, both in funding and regulations. And so it, for what we can tell, those two will still be standalone agencies, but they'll probably gobble up some other uh, divisions or agencies from other state agencies that are part of this consolidation effort. Um, if you talk to state employees right now, there's a lot of concern and worry about where they might land, um, in both as an individual basis, but also if they're part of like a smaller division. Uh, but uh, it's not settled yet. I don't know when it will be settled. The, the law basically just uh, shrunk it down from 37 agencies to 16. Uh, again, like DNR, IDA, the big ones are going to stay. It's just a matter of what some of these other divisions are going toward. They may eliminate some of the things like uh, kind of different names and reorganize them in some fashion. Uh, I don't, we don't know, but I feel fairly confident that the main ones that cities rely on or work with will stay in place. If I won't see much of a change at all, uh, fingers crossed. <laughs> that's, that's it. Uh, any questions on that? Mm -hmm. Interesting time to be a state employee right now. The next one, a lot of cities don't do this, but I did want to point it out just in case. Um, so some do are very heavy into kind of energy, energy benchmarking, energy efficiency. Uh, a lot of our members are not, but I know some are really, they spend a lot of time and, and funding on it to improve energy efficiency uh, or work with the community. I know Dubuque is one that has certainly done that um, both internally, but also with the community where um, basically the law is you cannot require properties in your community um, to do some kind of energy reduction benchmarking in a year over year sense, which is typically the case when you talk energy efficiency type folks or programs. Um, well, obviously the whole goal is to reduce energy uh, usage uh, in the name of efficiency and cost savings, uh, but basically you can't stipulate uh, that there's some kind of measured success or measured goals uh, to reduce the energy. Uh, so that's really the, the thrust of it. Again, most of our cities don't really have programs like that, but the, the ones that do, this will uh, most likely have them go back to the drawing board and take out any sort of like requirements or stipulations, just make it more like a voluntary type program would be my guess. Um, but, uh, we'll have to see on that one as well. And then the last one, we just kidded a second ago about some good news. So if you have volunteer firefighters, um, there's a lot of them adopted that basically gave them 
the ability to purchase tires on the backs of like either a city purchasing program where you've got a discount contract with like a local tire supplier uh, and or the state. The DOT always have, I'm sure you're familiar with most of you, the, the state negotiated purchase program, mainly for vehicles, but they have some other stuff too, equipment, tires. So a volunteer firefighter can take that state bid or city bid or the negotiated discount and get it for personal purchases of tires. It's at their expense. The state law did make that clear, but they don't get to use public funds for personal vehicles and personal tires, but they do get to kind of piggyback on negotiated discounts or contracts. So there's your good news for the year. <laughs> All right. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that was proposed that did not get passed. Frankly, some of it's even scarier than House File 718, which was property tax reform that we fully expect to be back next year. So we'll start with that one and just kind of again keep you know, House File 718 in the back of your minds. We'll get to the details of that uh, after this. But I do want to highlight this because it's going to be uh, really important for all the cities and uh, the league itself to uh, work our tails off yet again to hopefully. Uh, minimize the, the negative aspects of these bills um, as they may be and uh, try to improve them as we can. So that first one is definitely um, would be, again, even worse, far worse, but potentially far worse than what was adopted this year. So that omnibus that um, was really the Senate side of things um, that's been around now for two sessions the big part, part of this was a local option sales tax piece. And that would essentially eliminate the local option sales tax from local governments, take that 1% and make it a 7% statewide sales tax. Okay, so we talked about this before. Some of you were around uh, last session when this was first introduced. And I've made this comment before, especially at the budget workshops, where I've never seen league members so freaked out in my now almost 15 years. Uh, we've been through a lot of ups and downs. I'm looking at Pat over here. He's, he's seen it all too. Um, but, part of me, but like this one, if you take away local option sales tax dollars from local government, it is the death knell for countless communities. The, 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 I don't know what you call it, the gift, I guess, or the, uh, the way they're trying to resolve this is we'll, you'll get one seven of the state uh, high. Well, the sales tax high. So you get basically the equivalent, and then they're actually this latest bill juiced it up a little bit. And so some cities and counties would get a little bit more than their current allocation of local option sales tax dollars. Sounds great, right? What's the real concern that we all have? Yeah. I mean, this becomes a state shared revenue at that point, and state shared revenues have a shelf life of like a category, you know. So it's not that's that's always the concern. Um, even if you get, say, 10% more for five years, you know, that's great for five years, but then you've got nothing for the rest of the time. That's that's a bad deal, obviously. Um, and most communities at this point are heavily reliant on local option sales tax dollars. It's basically been a way to keep property tax rates at a sustainable, you know, steady, lower number in a lot of places. Whether say, legislators believe that or not, that's really the impact in most communities uh, that local option sales tax allocation. Uh, so if it goes to the state, we will forever be counting the time until they start rolling it out or you know, decreasing the amounts till eventually it zeroes out, just like the backfill, just like all the stuff in the past. Um, if anyone's been around for a while understands the history, it's not a good history for local government. So that's one piece to it. That was in place last year, it came back this year. This year, not only did they bring that same idea back for local option, they threw in a steeper rollback for commercial industrial railroad properties, going from 90 to 80 percent, just another one just lopped off. So less, ta less taxable valuation for local governments, um, and nothing to do whether you're a growing community or not, just uh, a, a bigger uh, rollback for commercial industrial railroad, and another uh, one, a new one for pipeline properties. Um, and there's some other smaller details in there, but those are the big pieces that um, obviously would be incredibly impactful to us uh, in our world. So, first of all, questions, if you have any about that legislation 
it, I will say this, it did not really get off the ground because they spent so much of their time at the legislature and capital dealing with, of course, like a lot of school issues, a lot of cultural issues, I would call them. And then at the end, the property tax discussion really just kind of sucked the air out of the room. So they got that done. They just never got back to this. But it's definitely number one on Senator Dawson's list. He's the uh, Ways and Means Chair uh, in the Senate. And this is this is his baby. He he will get this done at some point in time, as long as he's around. And so um, no guarantees, of course, you never know what the next session is going to look like. But uh, it's pretty, we're all pretty sure that's going to be the number one thing for him and some others next uh, session. So we need to be ready. Questions? How much of uh, your revenue comes from local office sales tax? <clears throat> start doing the math, start making your case because that's what we have concerns with. And I know that the pushback will be, you got to trust us. We heard it so many times last year when this was really kind of going hot and heavy and Dawson was really pushing it hard and met with our board, you know, and you know, he basically said, yeah, I, I get that there's an elephant in the room, but you got to trust us. We support you. And the thing is, you can take them for the word. You really can. But are they going to be here in five years? Are they still going to be in the capital with power in five years or seven years? Like, that's always the case. They make this deal that the future legislators do not. And they don't care, frankly. It's not their deal. It's not their commitment. That's assuming you could take them at their word, which we have trust issues for very real reasons, all due respect to our uh, state reps and senators. Um, they haven't probably been on our side of the fence very often and seeing these things go away. Has there been any talk with, with this change about when that when they give us back that one percent that is ours, will it have the same, um, will we still use it like we use our local option now in Manchester, for instance, our 90% goes to streets, 10% goes to walkways. Will they put restrictions on it or will we still be able to use it for what we currently are? That's a great question. And it's been a funny contention, except first, yes, that was it. Like you basically have to continue to use it for your allocated revenue purpose statement, <laughs> especially if you have bonding or any kind of debt based off of it. Um, that got loosened up a little bit. But then it kicked back to 50% of it must be used for property tax relief. So it was like, okay, we'll give you more flexibility, go ahead and have it. And I don't, I mean, to be perfectly honest, like full cost of sales tax as a whole is property tax relief. Because if you didn't have that you, and you still needed a fund XYZ over here, where are you going to get a fund? You're going to use your general fund or you're going to use debt. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's, it's in property tax relief, just in concept as it is. So, there would probably be some form that we all have to do, but there's always another form where these things happen. And you'd have to demonstrate that 50% with the property tax relief somehow. And here's the other 50% goes to roads, public safety, beautification, community development, whatever the case may be. So I don't think you'd have to do revenue purpose statements anymore, but I think the 50% for property tax relief would have to be demonstrated. That's probably be another line in the budget or something in AFR or a new report to turn into the state because they love those. That'd be my guess. But that has been part of this whole conversation. Because some cities use it for debt and they have five, eight, nine, ten years left to pay off banking on local option sales tax dollars. So that was another thing they threw in. It was like, okay, if you have debt committed, once that's paid off, you're kicked to this new format, whatever that is. Good question. I uh, had a visit from Nathan Overberg from Ollers and Company last week, and his suggestion, not questions, his suggestion where, you know, we, we had our eye on and we had as much help as we could get in what you do. Um, it was striking to me at eye of eye, the words were said from I don't know who, that they've never had a career where they felt more like a social work counselor to city managers across the state. So that apparently is going to stop. It makes us question what level of influence we actually have. So Nathan's comment was, you're probably at the point, me, others, to go on the offensive with your PR on this stuff. And so um, I've done it already. I will 
continue talking about it, but I just encourage everyone in the room to be in front of it because no one's going to know what this means until they have a hit and run accident themselves and wonder why their hit and run accident report hasn't been touched in a month and a half or why we can't hire a building inspector or code inspector. So make sure you communicate the emotion to folks with this. Absolutely. Yeah, and you'll hear me say that a lot. And I'll tell you a couple of things. I, I mean, I said before, like last year, I've never seen our membership so like vocal. This year is the same, uh, which is great. You should be. Uh, if I were in your shoes, I would be a little freaked out as well. Um, <clears throat> we're picking up on that in the league. I wish we'd move a little quicker to be perfectly blind because uh, I feel like we're at a crossroads right now in our state when it comes to supporting local government and giving local governments the tools they need to provide the services that our citizens use every single day. I mean, I don't need to tell you all, you're the folks who provide the services that most citizens use every single day. And then it's the state that has effects. Okay, so, uh, and I believe strongly in it, and we have to do something. So the league, we are gonna start this simplicity project, we're calling it, like videos that you all can use locally to share with citizens about it's kind of fun little kid explainer videos like what cities do, the services you provide every day. The real hope that we have is both to inform our membership. We have, I'm not trying to be disparaging whatsoever, but a lot of elected officials who do not really even understand what their city does on a daily basis. And then be able to explain it to citizens and eventually legislators. That's really the goal. We don't have a PAC. We can't have a PAC, uh, the League of Cities. We don't have a super PAC. We can't handpick people to run for a state house like other groups can and then influence them to do things that may be counter to what we believe in. And so what do we have? We have numbers. We have thousands and thousands of elected officials and appointed officials across the state. Getting them all to sing the same tune is really difficult, without a doubt. But the one thing that we do have, we do know, is that you all need to provide services to your citizens. And you can't do that with shrinking budgets and getting one leg chopped out from you, especially if like local option sales tax dollar disappeared. Um, my little property tax stuff, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, so that's part of it. So that's gonna be launched here soon. We're gonna follow that up with a storytelling project. Same effort to just get cities more tools, more one criticism, which is I, I know why I work for a city, like cities don't do a very good job of basically marketing themselves. It's not what we do. We don't look for pats on the back. We're not trying to get new customers to the table. Uh, we just do a job when we go home. That's city government. And that's good. It's good to be modest and humble. No one wants to hear how great you know, the city manager is up there, like, give me another award or give me a raise. You know, like, no, stuff like that. But we have to. Again, we're at a crossroads, I feel like, where we have to go back to the citizens and explain to them the value of their contract. They pay property tax dollars, they pay sales taxes, they pay fines, they pay fees for this and that. Here's what you're getting every single day, right? You get police, you get fire, you get clean water, you get to flush your toilet, doesn't happen in your backyard, you get roads to conduct business on, you know, you know move your goods, move your services, right? All this stuff matters. Parks, trails, quality of life, hugely important. Who wants to live in a town that doesn't have a park or a library? Or anything else for their their kids to do. I don't. I would never live move to one of those towns. But that's the stuff that's on the line. I I would say. Because here's what's next. Well, I'm not going to get off the track here for sure. Got my Linda's list. You've heard all this before. But um, like one of the things that happens for sure, if you if this local option sales tax bill, when the worst case scenario goes through five years time, they they take away that funding because the state budget's upside down. Where are they going to go? They're going to go stuff like this. Take share of revenues. So say that all happens. What's the first thing your city would cut? Well, if you went to your council today and say we lost 15% of our revenue year over year, what would your like, cut be? Library. Library. Parks. Parks. Swimming, well, swimming, pools. swimming pools. They don't make any money. Non-essential services. Right. We wouldn't fill police. And what's the, net, what's the reactive measure that some legislators would propose? If they saw a bunch of cities having to say, we're not going to hire three police officers because we can't afford it. Or we're not going to buy a fire truck, we can't afford it. 
<clears throat> they're going to go down that essential, non essential path. Some of you veterans remember these talks. There's like essential, public safety, roads, clean water, probably, non essential, parks, rec, library, pools. We know it's all essential. All of this makes up the quality of life in our community. Our citizens demand us to provide. Let's be honest, no city just looks around, most cities anyway, just looks around and says, well, let's try that out. Like, no, you're doing what your citizens tell you to do, what they're telling their council to do. We want X, Y, Z. We want a new splash pad. We need a coffee shop in the library. We want a gathering place, a community center to host events. We want a fireworks display. Let alone the, you know, the bread, the, the nuts and bolts. That's what you all do. So, you know, some cities say, oh, we've got to cut the police and fire. I can guarantee you some legislators will say, that's essential. You can't do that. You have to cut over here first. Not a good place to be. So, the doom and gloom. But that's where, again, we have, we can't sit back and just hope for the best. We got to do something about it. So this project is really meant to do that. We're trying, like the best hope that I think we have is to get more, more citizens educated, like a civics lesson almost, get them engaged. They talking to their legislators and along with our elected officials is going to be the way we can move the needle. Um, as great and as smart as you all are, most legislators are going to look at you all as appointed staff. You got a salary, you're trying to protect yourself. Which is cynical and, and I think a wrong way of looking at it, but that's what we hear from certain legislators. Not all. Some of them understand what you all do and support you. But right now, no, do not. So we got to do something about it. All right, we'll get to property taxes, I swear. Um, notice publication requirements. This one finally got some real chance. It all it got out of committee this year. It's been around for several years now, but it's kind of just kicked to the side, mainly because the newspaper association throws a fit and a bunch of rural newspapers will close, which is awful. Nobody really wants that. And we try to make some more like uh, ethical solutions where you know, just use a newspaper's website rather than like a city website that somewhere in the middle. But the, for most cities, it's the cost certainly, but it's also the timeliness. I mean, how many of you have had some kind of screw up with your public hearing notices because the newspaper didn't run it on the state the day that they said they're going to run it. Now your whole schedule screwed up. And that, that's part of that's just as much of an issue, I think, than the cost itself. It's just you want to get it out. And people expect it to be these days, you know, news comes like this. It's on social media, it's on websites, and that's all you got to do. So that's the effort. It got again, it got some momentum this year. It will be brought back next year. We have some confidence we'll finally get something through that'll obviously save you a little bit of money, but could be important to save you some time. But we're hopeful. Um, another thing that I think got out of the committee on the House side, or actually a whole, a whole House approved it, but the Senate didn't take it up, was a weapons omnibus. Um, there's a bunch of stuff with that, but the biggest thing for uh, local government, city governments was. The provision you might have read this in the news about uh, being able to have a gun in a public parking lot or a firearm uh, in a public parking lot. Um, most of the news was related more to schools. Um, obviously, most schools have weapons bans on um, public pro their property. A lot of local governments do as well, although that got more complicated uh, two sessions ago when you had to have, if you have a weapons ban to enter a facility. You have to have a, a security apparatus and somebody staffed to it. You guys remember that one at all? Not a big issue for most cities, but some do. Uh, but this one would extend it out basically to the parking lot. So even if you have a weapons ban, somebody would be able to have it in their vehicle. I put it in quotations because out of sight, like what does that even mean? I don't know. Um, but in a in a locked privately owned vehicle. Uh, so just again, keeping this is more of a law enforcement is issue, but if it does go through, we'd have to change a little bit potentially on how we uh, secure or observe our parking lots. Okay. Dangerous dog breeds. This one also got picked up in the news quite a bit. This brings up a lot of uh, strong feelings from folks on either side of the issue. Uh, I know there's been a handful of cities that have tried uh, ordinances or, or put, did have ordinances or currently do that, where it says that um, ban specific breeds. 
Um, typically, the um, what's the oh my gosh, I'm going to about why they're pivoting. Um, you know, it's usually a one that um, usually you'll see in the city ordinance. And so there's a fair number of cities that have that. Some have done done away with that and they focus more on just like violent pets and they, just, they don't care if it's a this dog or alligator. I don't know. People got some weird stuff out there. And you hear some stories from some of those exotic pet owners. It's like, wow, I okay. uh, didn't know that existed. But um, this one specific to dogs and basically the law would be you cannot uh, ban a specific breed. Uh, so if that occurs, of course, we'll have to, some cities out there may not make some adjustments, uh, but it died just in the Senate just to get picked up. Um, ATE comes back every single year. The range is all over the place. You still have some legislators, including the former mayor of Urbandale, who's like a, the biggest anti ATE guy in the world. He still wants to prohibit them. To What's an ATE? To, uh, automated traffic enforcement. So mainly speed zones, but there are a few cities have them for red light um, control at busy intersections. Um, so the range is just outright banned. Uh, then some more reasonable things where like, okay, you can only charge X amount of dollars. And then those dollars have to be used for like public safety purposes, which most of the cities, there's only, I think, eight cities, eight or nine cities in Iowa that have AT in place anyway, but um, and maybe a few counties. But um, it would kind of curtail some of the amounts as well as saying the revenue has to be used for X, Y, Z public safety reasons. So it didn't go anywhere this year, but it comes back every year. So you gotta keep your keep your eyes on it. Uh, this one's a more positive one, the length of service award program. Basically, uh, the state was set aside a million dollars to do matching funds for <clears throat> I think the cutoff is 20 years. That's been this kind of the idea for a while for public safety officials, uh, police, fire, mainly in our world, but also an EMP ambulance. A lot more cities are having to do that. Uh, so 20 year folks would get some kind of award, financial award that you all would match. Um, it's been around for several years now. And if a million bucks seems to be pretty easy for the state right now, but uh, just, I don't know if this somehow dies. Year after year, but police supports it. I think it's a good idea. That, uh, so you have to come up with their share. That's part of the deal, yeah. <laughs> right. Which well, something you probably don't already do. So maybe if you already have some kind of longevity pay or something like that, you you get this big that already in existence, and then go to the state and get a little bit more. Um, but a million dollars doesn't get very far across the state. So, uh, but trying to. Trying to be balanced and fair here, Aaron. <laughs> They're just reducing how much money I have. Right, right. Much how much more. Budget, right. Uh, the last two are, I think, pretty concerning for some communities. How many of you have a stormwater utility ordinance? So some of you do. It tends to be a larger city issue. Where you're trying to um, basically prevent, uh, uh, I'm not trying to be disparaging developers, but bad development where they develop a property a certain way that causes some kind of uh, erosion water control problem down, down stream, down the way in that area. Uh, there's been a lot of bad examples of that. Um, now that I say that most developments go really well, they're well planned out, well executed, well designed, well, well built. But every now and then a city will run into an issue where something doesn't go to plan or something gets overlooked or a developer cuts a corner, let's be honest. And suddenly someone in that area has water in their basement or it's wiping out a whole bunch of like something <laughs> and it's a bad deal. And so that's really the thrust, like the main idea of storm stormwater. Um, most cities that have a fee, it's like really small. Um, it's not really meant to make revenue. It's just meant to basically say there's some administrative work and the city coming out inspecting whether yeah. this development's going to plan. So we're gonna try to capture some of that. But uh, this um, would basically take away a lot of that. The only thing you could really have in terms of regulations is you know, the flow would have to be the same as it was prior to construction. So there'd still be some work to do for the city, but it would really be limited um, in terms of just that. You couldn't get into like the topsoil stuff, like making sure they have a, a, a soil compaction plan, um, any of the things you put in, uh, into place like that. Um, so that would be pretty significant for the cities to have such an ordinance. 
And then similar to that, building codes preemption, the main thrust here was exterior um, building materials, uh, conditions. This uh, came from a former council member. So this is like our own folks kind of hurting our, <laughs> ourselves, um, who's a developer who really doesn't like in certain cities that they require certain types of materials, like baseline uh, types of materials, mainly for housing. Um, is what the issue is, like siding, roof material, um, things like that. That um, some a lot of cities have like some kind of like you know it's got to be this quality or better type of thing. Um, some developers really bristle at that. They find it to be expensive or what have you. Uh, so that was that was the main idea behind it. I mean, there were some other parts of the law that got into some other things, but that was really really about the exterior uh, building materials for really housing. Single family homes. So again, all of those uh, are likely to come back next year. The the new the, the, the one I I mean the, the loss the overall tax on this is by far away the most concerning to us, and we'll be uh, working with you all to uh, hopefully stay engaged in that conversation and try to impress upon the need to not do that. <laughs> So that's probably let's go back to the property tax before any questions on any of that stuff before we really have some fun with property taxes. Okay. If you can show the website, that's gonna be the easiest way for you all to really digest this. If you haven't already, some of you I'm sure have. Our goal is not this is the basics, what we have up there now, just reading through law, condensing it down, summarizing the, the aspects that are most important to cities. There's other parts of this to deal with school. Um, property taxes and uh, counties. Um, there's some other things in there um, that uh, affect others, but the, the stuff, of course, that we cover on our page is really city government. And there's, I would say, two major aspects to this. One is this sort of system to potentially, depending on your, your city's growth, to suppress your general fund level. Okay. The other part is the new truth and taxation like system, I guess you could call it. Um, and then there's other parts too that we'll need to talk about as well uh, to deal with bonding, uh, general obligation bonding, and um, a base a payment plans. Basically, I have to use a minimum assessment agreement going forward. So the big pieces though are, um, if you scroll down a bit more, um, this tax rate, okay? So, it gobbles up a whole bunch of those different levies that are out there available for you now. They're all listed under 384.12. Most cities don't use them at all, but the one that a lot of cities use is that emergency levy. If you've ever been, ever been to budget workshops, I always hate that label because it should be called like supplemental levy. It's that 27 cent levy. I think there's around 600 cities out of 940 that use that. Maybe not the full 27 cents, because you can be less, but most of it have it are at the full 97 cents. That's the one that's most concerning to us because that essentially makes your everyone know eight dollars and ten cents is your general fund levy, right? That's the, the max you can do for this general fund operational um, type of revenue. But then this 27 cents is kind of a it's supplemental, which they call it supplemental. And so it makes it an effective cap of 837. Okay. The main idea behind this side of the bill, this part of the bill, is to get everybody capped at ATAC. That's it. So in FY29, kind of skipping ahead here, but FY29, that's the new cap <coughs> bar none for these all these levies listed. So again, you got your general fund of A10, you've got your emergency levy of 27 cents, and then you've got all these other ones that out of that list, the ones that are probably most commonly used be community center. There are a number of cities have that and library. Those are now part of your 810 starting next fiscal year. Okay. So that's your, there's a name for it. We call it the ACGFL. It's like your aggregated general fund levy, basically, um, is how this is going to be. The others that you utilize, most cities have what? A liability insurance levy. What else? Anyone? Employee Other employee benefits yeah. on debt service, right? Those are probably three, three other most common, like and Ipers probably as well. 
So those are outside of it. You're not touching those. You can still utilize those. They didn't put any caps on some of those that don't have a cap on them, right? Now, the big cautionary tale is that sounds great, at least like gave us or kept some freedom for you all, some flexibility. But if your general fund levy is getting suppressed a little bit, the natural reaction in for your, you and your council is to do what? What takes some of that benefit cost and put it in other, other employee benefits levy, right? But what does that do? It raises it to your level, which nobody really wants to do in normal times, let alone this all this one. So it's not like a great solution, but at least you still have that flexibility. Your council does. Um, so that's that's the first part. Now, how does this thing get suppressed? This is where the math gets really crazy. They're going to try to mock up a model since we don't have everybody for you yet. But basically, the, what our hope is to be able to give you like the, the ability to type in your city, and if you go above these different thresholds, these different tiers are calling them. Here's what happens to your general fund levy, the levy itself. Okay, so if you scroll down a little bit, Marla, there's a there's a whole there's three tiers. Okay, there's cities that grow by your this is on your set valuations. If you grow by less than three percent, nothing changes. Okay, to your general fund levy. If you grow between three and six percent, your levy is going to be suppressed down by a certain quotient. Really funky math, but it's in there. And if you grow by more than six percent on assessed limitation year over year, I'm talking about, then it's suppressed even further. Okay, so this is where it's entirely dependent on your assessed valuation growth. For funsies, I looked up Asbury from uh, FY21 to no. FY22 to FY23, they're like 10% growth. So they're going to be in that high uh, category. And if you are, if you scroll down a little bit, Marlo, please. Well, this, so we have these steps here, and they are, we try to do our best to make these actually readable and understandable. It's even more complicated than before, which is, we thought the whole idea was to simplify the property tax system in Iowa. That's, this makes it even more complicated. So the first two steps here are basically what's your current assessed limitation or assessed value in your city, line 2A in the budget, which is important because that is with gas and electric, but non tip okay? So you look at your current year, and then when we get to FY25, you get your property valuation reports, that'll be the other numbers. So you're comparing those two years, you're gonna be doing that through FY28 every time. So then the next part is, again, if you're less than 3% growth in those two years, year over year, nothing changes. You don't have to uh, suppress your rate down. Your, those, that general, that new general fund levy, untouched. But for the cities that are over three and between three and six and over six, there is a mechanism where you have to basically you calculate your new assessed value and you generate a tax rate off of that. Does that make sense for some of you may get it? Remember that Ted's little trick or back in the day, Steve Moore's trick, where you can type in on your on your city budget forms that got all the calculations embedded. You could put in some astronomical number and it would generate your max $8.10. You didn't really have to even know your value. You didn't have to type it in. You could do it that way. That's essentially what this is doing behind the scenes. By taking those three to six percent growth cities and over six percent growth cities. And saying, okay, well, this is we're gonna it's basically a new limitation on your assessed value of what they're doing. They're taking that and growing, suppressing it down by this by either two or three percent, so it doesn't grow by more than that. So if you're a 10 percent growth city on assessed limit on your assessed value, your down your actual growth is gonna be two percent. And then you generate your tax rate based off of that valuation. That's it. That's what's really happening in this math. Again, we'll help you with that. Ted will certainly be very busy man this summer because he's going to be helping with this and doing calculations based on the valuations and how they play. Um, he's going to have to embed probably some new formulas in that form that we all use. And then we'll get to the next phase where he'll also be, uh, next piece of this where he'll definitely be coming up with a new form for us. So before we get to that part of it, because that's the second big piece of this whole uh, piece of legislation, questions on this tax rate. I'm calling it suppression for some cities, though. So I don't want to be sounding alarm bells because not every city grows by 
or 5% or 10% for that matter. Um, some, quite a few of our cities, in fact, are going to be in that first tier. Um, they're not growing very much, if at all. Um, now, I will also say this. The timing was not an accident. Because what just happened to our assessments in most places, not most, in several pockets of Iowa, uh, they went up by a substantial amount. Right. The reevaluation process occurred. It's been a super hot residential real estate market in some parts of Iowa. It's reflected in those assess new assessments coming out from the audit that just came out um, like last month or so. And the timing was not an accident. So those communities that have some of these substantial assessment growth occurring citywide, they're going to be in that over 6% category. That would, again, not an accident. That's not everywhere. Much of you want some legislators want to believe, some people to believe that most of Iowa, in fact, is not growing uh, much at all. In fact, we had, what, 649 cities um, from the 2010 to 2020 census lost population. And before that, the 2010 census, same deal. Before that, same deal. It's been the case for a long time. Um, but the high growth communities are definitely going to deal with this. Did any of this impact TIF at all? No, that was on the table. The TIF part of this conversation, I, the, 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 our government affairs team would probably tell you that they just, they just lost steam. They definitely want to address TIF. Some of them do. TIF has always been a weird animal, as you know, Pat, mm -hmm. where you get some Democrats and some Republicans who hate it. And you get some Democrats and some Republicans who love it. It's one of those weird political issues or public policy issues that somehow divides even you know people on the same side of the aisle. Um, but I think that's partly why. And I, but more, more than anything, I think they just got to the end of session and it's like, let's just do this. We'll deal with the rest of the big stuff next year. So no, Tim is not affected by itself. However. I talked to John Dennis uh, last week at the Nuisance Abatement Conference about this. And he said, well, some of the ideas were far worse, so I guess we're okay. Um, but when you are looking at your entire financial structure of your city government, non-TIF, TIF, all of it impacts you, of course. And eventually those TIF properties are not going to be TIF properties. And they'll be back to normal, so to speak, in terms of what you can collect as a city government from property taxes for your general budget. So if there is an overall kind of suppression going on, TIF revenues could be indirectly affected as well. It may take some time before you see it, but it could happen. So the moral of the story might be if you have a TIF nearing the end of its life, yeah. you want to get it off and you want to it It could be. Yeah. So that in, you, you at least you've got that in your base now going forward. Yeah. Okay. Right, because you want that higher value. Yeah. Right. Could be. I mean, that's like, as we all have a tip for cities that have it, it can be so unique from town to town. Yeah. And the increment that's occurring, like some of it might be very slow, you're kind of waiting. Others are, you're nearing the end, you're kind of like, okay, we're not really going to see more increment, might as well yeah, close it off. That leads me to one piece of this that is important related to bonding, which makes it, you can only do a referendum for bond uh, when you need to in the uh, same time as a, the general election, regular elections each year, November, whatever, each year. So right now you can call for a special election when you need to do a referendum for certain types of bonds, mainly the general corporate general general corporate purchase bonds. Um, you have to wait until November for any issuance like that, where you, where you need a referendum as part of it, which was at first the bill was every other year, only regular city elections when you can do it. That was even much more problematic because you don't know what the bond market is going to be like in six months, let alone 18 months. And so that was concerning. So it's still not uh, great, but it's better than every other year. Another piece of this related to kind of tip or urban renewal work is tax abatements. This, the law changes this a little bit, maybe a lot for some where any kind of abatements have to be basically a part of a minimum assessment agreement. Are really familiar with those, or some of you are? A lot of this become more popular, popular here in recent years. Um, a way to basically, they're a good idea, a uh, way to, for U.S. city government to basically have some protection. Uh, if you're going to commit to some kind of incentive package, 
uh, tax abatement, basically waiving taxes for a period of time, that you want some commitment from that developer or property owner to construct something that's going to bring value to your community and for you as a city government taxable. Value. So the minimum assessment part is that you're going to have a minimum size property that generates a minimum asset value of X. Um, could be more, but here's the minimum. And so that's the, the condition now for tax abatement programs. You have to utilize minimum assessment agreements. There will likely be a new report or an add on to the AFR. There's some, kind of some squishy language in there about <coughs> new things to report on in the AFR, which I don't think will be done in time for this cycle, probably for the next cycle, FY25. Another thing that Ted's going to have on his list of chores to do this summer since he largely manages that in conjunction with the auditor's office um, for cities tech is kind of a guy that helps disseminate and work with the forms so that's another piece of this as well other questions okay there's one more yeah go ahead they leave that stuff in there where you have to notify like we have some letters out but yes then does that back up our our certification time and all that happy stuff Happy stuff indeed. Yes, so this is the other piece. Uh, Marla, if you go down a little bit, there's a whole list. Now, don't freak out today. Don't have to know everything about this today. Um, I think it's keep going down. Oh, I should have mentioned I lost over. There's uh, expanded uh, exemptions for homestead property, um, elderly ones as well for 65 and over, uh, and military as, as well. Those are just uh, revenue reductions, basically. Uh, it can be affected differently by each city and how much you have of this type of property or, or eligible property owners that can uh, apply it for and get these uh, credits, but they're not going to be state funded like they used to be. That's so we don't it's get just those it's like four thousand dollars right now. It's thirty two fifty, and it's going to go to sixty five hundred for that new homestead one. Uh, it's lowering their taxable value by that amount, just a dollar figure amount. That's how they're going to do it instead of like a state funded tax credit. Like it's always been, that's what they're doing instead. Yeah. So if you have a lot of old guys like me, <laughs> I mean, you're rejoicing over here. Yeah. yeah. Sounds good to me. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I mean, a lot of my work is um, elderly residents, of course, and property owners. Um, but I would say the homestead credit itself is a very popular thing. So, that's that's out there, been out there for many years. The difference though is it's kind of lowering the taxable value rather than it all being done by the state just taking out tax credits to the county. And you're not seeing a difference. So we don't get that credit anymore. No. Okay. Yeah. Over time, I think it's FY26 when this is fully paid now. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> all good news. Um, so that's the stuff about the uh, property tax abatement agreement. Um, there's a little sweetener in there for city of Des Moines and the DART folks. Um, basically, they can charge more through franchise fees to help pay for the transit system in the Des Moines area. Um, and then we get into the thing that Linda brings up, which is this new sort of tr truth and taxation system, these taxpayer statements. So the counties actually are going to have a lot more work to do. Here's the real thing. So there's a whole long list. Again, don't have to remember all this today. A new form will definitely come out. You will have to insert information. It'll probably be pretty similar to your public uh, notices that we've done before. We're trying to clarify this. So I'll start with this. We hope, hope that 384.15a got repealed by this. We think it did, which is the um, max levy notice and hearing and replaced with a new Property tax statement, I forget what's their name, but property tax payer statement, hearing and notice. We'll get all the details here. This is where Ted really has some work to do with their legal team at the Department of Management to figure out exactly what the legislature meant with this new idea. But essentially, there's going to be a new form. Okay. The county is going to have to provide you that a lot of that data. You'll pump in your data, your tax rate, your kind of again, similar to your. Um, hearing notice that you've had in the past for both the max levy and the an annual budget. Um, so if you go down a little bit further, there's actually a list of things that it needs to include. The county is going to have a lot of responsibility here. 
So that's that's the gist of it. So again, don't freak out. We're going to get a new form. We'll have instructions from Ted and Department of Management on how to do that, the timeframes. But there is a change, a big change. So April 30th is now the new deadline to certify. But sounds better. But March 15th, we're going back to March 15th, that you have to have your information ready to provide to, to uh, publish your notice regarding this uh, taxpayer statement. And then you have to give it to the county. The county then has five days. This is where I, I think they're dreaming, but we'll see. The county has five days then to do their job and mail each taxpayer their individual statement from each city in their county, along with the county information and the school information. So the idea basically is that each taxpayer statement will include um, a lot of the same information, but a little bit more detail out, which we're supportive of. Like, let's, I mean, it's great to be transparent. It should be a little bit more modernized and it should be standard across the state. Some counties, like Polk County forms are fantastic. Honestly, give them a lot of credit. Um, they, they give all this information, actually. I think they, the law was kind of written based on what Polk County does with their statements, um, but not every county does that. It's a little bit more basic or less informative. The idea basically being that each taxing entity is broken out, each jurisdiction, so of course cities, counties, and schools, but also community colleges, uh, uh, drainage districts, and there's a handful of other small, small things, but they're out there. And then the, the big idea is show a comparison from last year to this year. With the, obviously for legislative intent, they want the people to see like, oh, it went up by 7% or whatever the case may be. That's what they're really trying to force local governments to show. Because um, the current statements don't really do that. It is that here's your current valuation or current assessment, capital valuation, here's how much you owe. So basically what most of them show, again, like Cole County get, does break this stuff out. Um, uh, so that's pretty nice. But that's really the idea behind all of this. So the county, again, the county's got a lot of work getting each city to provide their information by March 15th, along with the school districts in their county, along with our county information for that matter, and all those other little entities out there, and then produce a statement to mail out to each uh, property uh, by March 20th. And that March 15th rate should be our actual rate. It should be like the max levy type thing. It should no, be what we're actually exactly. intending to levy. Yes, that is going to be a comprehensive. It's kind of a, be redundant in a way okay. because then you go back and have your normal annual budget hearing and notice okay. um, prior to April 30th. But yeah, that's the idea. Like this is what we're doing this year. Um, total tax rate, you know, the big categories, total funds, total expenditures of each fund, that kind of thing. A lot of work on the auditors mm -hmm. and treasurers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So again, we're gonna have to wait and see exactly what guidance we get from Ted or Kerry Johnson, uh, who does county budgets at uh, the Department of Management, and go from there. I'm sure they'll be spending a lot of time in the summer going through this word by word and building forms um, for us to use, and then we'll obviously share them and get people trained up on it. We'll probably do, uh, again, we'll talk about a couple of webinars this summer that we'll get um, a lot of what we we'll talked about today in more detail, budget workshops. I might imagine we're gonna have to do a couple extra sessions um, sometime late fall, early winter, um, as more of this is known as we get closer to budget season and people are trying to start working on their budgets. Uh, so, Keep your you know, keep connected with us. We'll pop out all the information and post our normal stuff. And again, probably have a few extra opportunities because it's a pretty big change. Some good annual conference sessions. Yeah. Oh yeah. Annual conference. We'll be getting this up quite a bit. We we know this is a big change on your probably your budget planning part of it. Obviously, it's gonna be that's a hard part for us because it's like cities are so different. We're all over math. And um, let alone like their assessed valuation, but also your tax rates and that, that sort of thing. You got debt, how much you got in your general fund. But then the, just the legalities and make sure you get your budgets done properly. That's going to be a whole other side to this. It's kind of two sides where we have to get some guidance out to you all. Questions? <laughs> Don't get too excited. Uh, in your observation, are they discussing what happens post ARPA? I mean, I, our auditors would tell you 
there's so many different uses for it, but the, the easiest and would seem to be the most um, effective or would be to somehow find a way for it to make payroll, which I don't agree with. Yeah. But governments are doing it. Oh, yeah. I mean, all I'm saying here is that there's an extreme amount of money still in our possession. Mm -hmm. um, and it would seem to me that this would put us more at risk because absent some of that money for capital project purposes, all of a sudden we don't have that. And now we have this. Yeah. Has that even been discussed across the legislation at all? No, no. And I don't, I, honestly, I'll be a little cynical because I trust you all. Like the state budget got a huge chunk of our money. Mm -hmm. And let's not kid ourselves. I think they're using some of that to kind of flip some of these other things to pay for it. I mean, so I don't think most of my search fund touch it from that angle uh, that they're doing all this destination Iowa stuff and other programming and funding OCIO and a lot of things they're doing with broadband. Like that doesn't happen without the federal powers. It just doesn't. And I think they know that. So I don't think there's any interest in like curtailing it or grabbing it. I mean, they're talking at the federal level of doing that. Um, I don't know, man, who, who knows how aggressive that is. For you all, the one thing I would say is probably spend it. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Like, whatever projects you think are necessary and good use of the funds, um, it is way opened up compared to the initial rules with basically water sewer infrastructure, maybe a couple other things, depending on the economic impact to your community from uh, COVID. But most cities in Iowa, that probably wasn't like a, a real significant impact to your revenues. And so you were able to take this other government, so the government services, that's the phrase they use for it, which opened it up quite a bit. So I know a lot of cities did water sewer because every city that has a water sewer system has some kind of need. Um, and, and that's probably where that was easily the most common thing that we heard. But when the rules got more relaxed, then you started seeing things like roads and bridges because there's obviously on any needs there as well. So my only got like just my more practical diet to spend it, like take the risk out of it and I don't know, speed up a project or two if you can. I mean, that's then I'll hear from cities, they'll say, like, well, yeah, that'd be great if we can get contractors to come to town and do work. Like, or we can't get anybody to do work right now. So, or you know, all the costs went up on that. So, anything we get from ARPA just kind of evens out the inflation in uh, doing a project right now. So, it's not like some kind of financial advantage for our community. But that's a good question. I, yeah, the other thing we still we don't know a lot about yet is the IIJA, the transportation bill that got juiced up um, this past year. The the only guidance we have thus far really hasn't changed much recently. Basically, it's going to be all a lot of the existing transportation funds that we've seen for years, just a little bit more, and it's still going to be competitive grants. Um, some of the cops will certainly get their hands on it, or the MPOs out there. Some will go directly to cities. Um, similar to the past, like the bridge program or the surface uh, improvement program, things like that, that is Iowa DOT has had in place for years and years. But there's a little bit more to go around. The downside of the world on that one is I think they're still going to use competitive grant applications, which I know are not fun. And a lot of our smaller cities don't have a grant writer of any sort. So ECIA can get some work out of this. For sure. I know you're on top of it. We got to retain staff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Should get like a 10% kicker. <laughs> What's your sense on additional property tax reform? Because it sounded just clips from Governor Reynolds after she signed the bill was like this was just the starting point. Yeah, they made a point. Yeah. Or off session that they're going to be doing. Yeah, they definitely made a point in that initial press release. So this whole thing, you're going to, I mean, um, a little teaser. Our June, you know, the president of the league, every other month they do a call. John Hale of the Mayor of Ames is our friend. Uh, board president. His, I saw a draft his column, and he's uh, not a happy guy right now, like a lot of people. I'm not happy. Um, the reason I thought of that is because the bill itself is a problem, like the, the policy itself is a problem. But it was run through in such a sprint with zero, almost zero public forums, interactions, that it was alarming. Like, this is kind of scary that it can happen basically 24 hour time. Like that Monday at 10 a.m. 
They had a subcommittee. They had not even dropped the amendment. They haven't made it public yet. The, the amended piece of this that the, the, the um, basically the negotiation between the House and Senate. They had two different property tax bills. So at 10 a.m. they had a sub or a committee meeting on uh, I think it was the House side, and it was referred to an amendment that only the people in the room had a copy of. Like wasn't available on this bullet was what legislature's website like normally didn't even appear anywhere until 2 30 that afternoon when they kicked it out to the to the floor like that's scary um so the reason i bring that up is uh what do they mean when they say we're going to come back and do more because then the, the, there was a press release that went out i think at like three that afternoon i mean this was all done this was like done deal all the stuff that happened that monday was just the motions of yeah. Congress essentially. Um, the deal had already been made. So they had a press release ready with the governor and the Speaker of the House and I think the President of the Senate or something like whoever it was, the leadership of, of each party or of, the, of the, each house in the Senate. And they made it very pointed to say that this is a start of changing, modifying, and improving property taxes. What would be next? What would be next? I mean, that's the question. I think if you look at if you know, history as a teacher of any sort, the ideas that have come up in the past are um, a, a strict cap on assessments, period. Like that two, like 2% two has been floated in the past. Uh, the non-essential and essential thing, that's the one I would probably predict if I had to predict something. Um, basically, you can't talk to essential services because this year, I forget which city it was, uh, maybe a couple cities um, said that, you know, if you do this, we're going to have to lay off police or fire or not hire open positions. And one of the senators on the floor basically said over my dead body, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And so that's the, again, like the, we'll make them essential. You can't touch police and fire public safety. So then if you do have to make cuts, where do they come from? That's where it is. That's been floated in years past for sure. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I don't think. Um, I don't think there's any real interest in really tearing down the rollback system. Which I, you know, in my opinion, just the whole system's been a debacle from 1978 on. It hasn't worked. Like we have evidence on the ground. You know, this is not working. But. Going back on that is, I think, really hard for the rest of the legislature. So I think let's continue to kind of nibble at the rate, how much can grow each year. I could see a hard cap on revenues. I talked about that like two years ago, just no more than 2% revenue growth, period, flat out, don't care. Whatever you are as a city, growing, declining, doesn't matter, no more than 2%. So what's the incentive to grow and to attract yeah. new revenue? Well, <laughs> yeah, that, and that's even come up with this bill, to a lesser extent, because it's not as severe as probably the first thing that got dropped by the Senate. But even like the city of Ames, which is you know a university town, they have a very strong, strong economy because of that and growing pretty steadily over, over the years. But even their finance officer basically said, with some of these aspects, like it would disincentivize us to grow. Like we would give less dollars from these new properties, new residents and businesses. But yet they need the same amount of services. They need more services. They need more services. That's right. Yeah. I mean, we all see this, like in the grow in the, in the growing communities that have to eventually add a fire station because the, the main stations too far away. The call response times are way too long, and that's a scary deal, especially if you own property, whether it's a home or a business that's way out in that new part of town, and my nearest fire station is 20 minutes away. That's a big deal. Let alone, you know, police. EMS, roads and bridges, we all know that. Like you gotta have a road to get to that new part of town. Um, and then all the rest of it, your library may have to expand and have to add more staff because you've got more people coming through at the rec center and they all want your attention. They all want to do youth baseball tonight. <laughs> you, know, you gotta you gotta have ball fields for these kids to play on. And if you are squeezed at your current part. Well, do we need to add four more fields? Where are we going to do that? I mean, all you guys know this, all that adds up to more services. But if those properties are kicking in 10% less or 15% less, how do you, and you still got your existing service advance? How do you afford it? 
That's the hard part. That's where that's where that, where that rhetoric comes from, where that response comes from, where it's like it's not even, I mean, how much can we really grow? Right. There's like somewhere in there's like probably a tipping point is lower than it used to be, probably. <coughs> say. What's your theory on why there's only one no vote? Yeah, this is the hard part. There was one no vote is actually uh, Senator Cormack in Ames. Um, I I mean, we're being recorded, so I have to keep it <laughs> professional for sure. Um, I think, I mean, politics have changed in this state quite a bit. And um, right now, nobody wants to be seen as pro-tax, pro, even pro-government. That's even, you know, Democrat, Republican, Independent. It's just an era we're living in. It's not just in Iowa. We've talked about this a lot in the biggest cities. Some of our state league colleagues from other parts of the country are seeing similar things. You've seen probably some of the trails of similar bills being adopted in Florida, Texas, Missouri, and Iowa. Um, it's all connected. I mean, and to some of these legislators' credit, they'll say it. Like, we got this from Alec. They'll ask him, like, where'd you get this legislation? The youth labor was a prime example of that. Um, where'd you get this out? The, I forget the exact now, American Legislative Exchange Com Commission, whatever. It's like a, you know, uh, a path, basically, a think tank. It comes up with legislation and they tell certain folks to pass it, they do it. If they want to get reelected, they do it. That's, I know it's very cynical. I'm trying not to be cynical. I'm trying to do but that's that's really what part of this is. And um, at times, I think Iowa is just getting swept up in it. Uh, they kind of search around, like, why is this a problem? Like, no one's even, I don't hear anything about it. The thing that probably upset me the most, I know I talked about this in the budget workshops last year, is some of these legislators say, oh, all I hear about on the campaign trail is property taxes. Like, well, why aren't those citizens going to City Hall? If that's true, if that's true, which I don't, frankly, think it's true across the board. But why aren't all these citizens, they're so darn upset about their property taxes. Why aren't they going to city hall? Why aren't they going to the county board? Why aren't they going to their school board? Every time we talk about it, mostly, how many of you get citizens that show up for your budget hearing? <laughs> what did most of your citizens probably say? You're fine, you're doing fine. I'm pretty sure they would tell you if they really hated your tax rate or your budget plan. You know, especially these days, there's no shortage of avenues with social media. Well, we're the most accessible yeah. level. Yeah, exactly. that fairway or Walmart. That's right. <laughs> no. yeah. So that's like kind of like like this is yeah. pretty made up. I've always had a potential solution, but no one would ever do it or listen to it. <laughs> what you do is you make a bunch of signs that say, and you post them on your library, and you post them on your parks, and you post them wherever areas where you're going to have to make cuts. You need to project these cuts sooner rather than later and say, this library will be closed on this date because of reduction in property taxes. If you have concerns, call your state senator, <laughs> name and phone number, call your state rep, name and phone number, and plaster those kind of signs out in your community and get the word out. This is what's going to happen. Just want to give you a little heads up, folks. Yeah. That's all you got to do. <laughs> uh, I mean, you and I have talked about this. Years ago, and I know others have too, but like a couple more minutes. I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. 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 which is out of the hallway. So, whenever um, <laughs> the, the, the scary thing is, honestly, for a lot of a lot, a lot of legislators on either side, you ask like their one no vote against this, like it tells cities close their pools, lay off police officers, and close libraries, shut down a park. That, They'll just say you're a crime wolf. Yeah. Again, on either side of the aisle. And I, but the problem is, who wants to do that? These these affect your community. These affect your citizens. If you close your pool, you shut down a park. And there was we did that survey. You guys remember early on in the session, we asked for like, you know, what are your budget issues? This is before any of this stuff happened. We got some responses back that I was shocked. And I've been doing this for a while. I've talked to a lot of cities. I was shocked. There was one city that we're going to sell our two parks. They're going to do this. They're already planning on doing this. They're going to sell two parks to just get a little more revenue and to float the next budget or two. Mm -hmm. Like that's that's, that's a scary that's deal. So a scary deal. There's a bunch of cities that we're not going to hire for this open position or these three positions. So it's already happening, but 
The other problem I've noticed is over the years, watching this for 50 years, is every time they throw a curveball at us like this, we adjust, yeah. we make it work. Yeah. So the next time they throw us another curveball, you made it work last time. Yeah. What's the problem? Exactly. Sometimes we're too good at our own jobs. Yeah. This is that's why it's such a difficult situation for us because it's like, what are you gonna do? Are you really just gonna shut down your fire station? I mean, great. Because I think what a lot of communities would do with this the high certain fundraisers, and they would just come up with something, sell off some uh, billboards with some corporate sponsorships. I don't, you know, you would make it even more innovative and creative than you already are, and cross train even more staff so they can be public works and parks, and also do some city work too. You know, come in and do some building. I mean, I honestly I could see cities doing that because it's like well, you can't cut. Any further, we've already done that. So, what do we have to do? We're going to have to get even more innovative and more creative. Well, I think you'll see some little towns maybe unincorporated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's yeah, I, that's I think that's a sad story. Yeah, that. the one I would say that would probably go past this property tax stuff. I mean, who knows what happened next session? Maybe it is even more drastic than this. The local option sales tax again, if that ever goes away, mm -hmm. that's all that's like. There's literally no two ways about it at that point. There's, there's only so much creativity and efficiency you can find. And we use local option dollars, it's yeah. all game for some places for sure. <laughs> all right. I want to leave on about 15 notes somehow. But... <laughs> 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 yeah, right. We have baseball and softball tonight. Uh, uh, yeah, they're doing great though. Yeah, they don't. The other day, our son Jack asked, like, um, or he said something I was, I was doing one of my rants because that's what I do in the club. And he's like, Oh, I didn't know cities did that. I'm like, Have I not? You know, I said something about clean water. Like, you get to turn your water on and drink it without freaking out. That's a pretty good deal. And he's like, That's what cities do. I'm like, Oh boy. I, I do. Have not watched those videos. Yes. <laughs> they will be fun. We can hopefully get those out really soon. That'll be on the theme. They're really fun. Um, yeah. These kids, actors were fantastic. So <laughs> that'll give us something to rally around. All right, I've got my own. Okay, we'll break for lunch tomorrow. Okay. You want to flip the slides for me and then I'll just kind of give you a nice. Okay. I'm just trying to find you folks. Uh, before I get to that, okay. How many of you folks had a COVID more than twice? <laughs> just curious. How many folks had COVID just once? How many people have never had COVID? Wow. You know, you <laughs> 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 One of the few people out there, I've never had COVID. Not, are you just taking this twice. opportunity to brag about like, Are you bragging? Yes, I am. Yeah, I'm bragging. <laughs> My wife had it twice. Now, I didn't move out, and I stayed there. And an hour before she took her at-home test and was positive, we were just suspicious. We were thinking it was a cold, so I kissed my wife, of course. <laughs> so <laughs> she takes the test an hour later, she's I'm positive. Uh, <laughs> gee, there's no way I'm not positive. Give me that stupid test. I'm going to take it to I was negative. What's your lunch I For about a whole time. And I don't know why. My theory is those of you who didn't get COVID, I think it was a few of you. How many of you have O positive blood? Yeah. No. Okay. I have a theory on that, and my doctor says I think there's something to that. <laughs> You've got O positive blood, you're smoking your immune system might be a little better. So now the other thing I did is I did D3. Zinc, um, B12, and I walk outdoors virtually every day, two and a half miles. The three, so I think those combinations I think may have served me well and uh, prevented me from getting COVID. But that's what we're here to talk about today. We're talking about tip. How many of your cities do tip? Please hands. Wow, I didn't know if you do tip. Okay, how many of you? Know little or nothing about tips. This is the first time you've been exposed to it. Okay, that's good for me to know 
because the challenge of a, of a thing like this is to get it to the point where those folks who have never been exposed to TIP kind of get a feel for what it is and what it's about without being over your head. Because the last thing you want to do is hear somebody talk about something and, and after three minutes you've lost them, you have no idea what they're talking. So I will try and keep it at a level that makes sense and also try to get stuff in here for those of you who have had TIP a long time who know TIP. Now, those of you who had tip, one of the things I did is challenge you on the agenda to, you know, if you've got a little information, a little handout you can share with folks, that would be great because that's how we all learn is what other cities are doing. So let's go to my next slide, and that is um, how many cups of tank will not get the next slide? Well, yeah, I'm trying to get it. I can't get it. I can't get it to the presentation really because do I just texted my teachers. Oh, okay. We're going to do it right. Well, all right. I will, and I'll catch up when we we get somebody here. But um, my experience in city government, I can't believe it. Uh, I'm coming up on 50 years in city government. So I started in 1974. Um, I was city manager in Makokoda. <laughs> That's where I got my really first exposure to TIP was in Makokoda. And then I ended my city administrator career at Animosa, which is where I still live. And those are the two towns where I learned a lot about TIP. Most everything I learned about TIP, I never learned of from one guy. His name is Bob Jobston. He was unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, but he was the, uh, the guru of TIP in the state of Iowa. And uh, actually, people in the legislature. <coughs> Sought him out and got his advice. It's well of a lot of cities, but he was a bonding attorney. Now, I also got a lot of in, um, opportunity to work with TIP when I worked with Ruan Securities Corporation, which is a company that helps issue bonds to cities. They've now been bought out by DA Davidson, but I helped a lot of cities put together bond issues that they use TIP money to pay back the, the debt. And then I also worked with Schneider and Associates, and then I had my own consulting service where I've worked with cities over the years with TIF. So I've seen TIF from a lot of different directions as a consultant uh, uh, with Ruan Securities, with Schneider and Associates from the engineering perspective to being a city administrator and being a consultant. So I've seen it from a lot of different areas. Okay, disclaimers, okay? I am not an attorney. Oh, there we go. All right, there we're up and running. Let's go to the next slide then. I am not an attorney, so you need to know that. Uh, and if you do tip, you need a bonding attorney. I cannot stress. If you remember nothing else, <laughs> remember that. And if you have a reluctant council member that says, no, we're not going to get a bonding attorney, it costs too much money, ask them this question. I always like to work with councils with analogies that they can understand. And here's an analogy they will understand when you're trying to convince them to use a bonding attorney. What if you went to a regular MD and you like that doctor? You know, your regular doctor, he prescribes your blood pressure medicine. He does a good, you know, does all things. And then all of a sudden you realize, you know what? I'm having a heart attack. I need open heart surgery. Do I call my regular MD that I really like and I really trust him? Even though he's never done any open heart surgeries, what the heck? He's a good guy. No, you wouldn't. You would call that cardiologist who has done a number of heart surgeries. Same thing with this. You call as someone who knows what they're doing is in multiple bond issues because, first of all, if they mess up, you will use, lose the tax exempt financing on your debt. You will pay interest rates at a taxable level. And there are, there's two cities out there that I know did that. They used the city attorney. City attorney didn't know what they were doing. And as a result, they didn't get the taxes in issue, and they had to pay at the taxable rate, which you don't want to do. The other thing is, TIF is always changing. There's always something new out there. So these folks that are specialized in this, the, the Ayers firm in Des Moines and the Dorsey firm in Des Moines, the John Dallas's of the world, they stay on top of this sort of thing. So they are your people that you go to. So. Okay, for those of you who are new to Jeff, let's go to the next slide. And that is, how do I wrap my arms around this and understand what TIF is? The acronym, T-I-F, what it stands for is number one, tax. The only tax we're talking about is property tax, okay? Number two, increment. The reason that is there is we're talking about the increased value 
that will now be added to a piece of property, which will then generate more taxes. And now financing. Typically, that new money that comes in from that new house or that new industry would go to your general fund, the small general fund. But with TIF, if you do all the right stuff, you capture that money before it goes to those general funds and you put it in a special fund that you use for economic development. So <laughs> always think in terms of the, the, an acronym and what it stands for. So it's taxes, the <clears throat> new value, the new increment, and the financing that you're now going to use probably to pay for economic development projects, okay? The, basic, uh, the basics of TIP, my next slide. Sorry. It's taking that tax money that you would have, would have gone to the general fund and you capture it and you reallocate how that money is used. It's the same tax money that every, everybody would have paid anyway. So instead of it going to the school, the county and the city, you're gonna take that money and it's gonna to go to the county auditor that county auditor is going to then give it back to the city, but you are very restricted how you spend it. And we'll talk more about that later. But the only money that you have your access to is the new money that comes in because you did a TIP uh, program or you did an urban real program. So when that money comes in, you just can't dump it anywhere. You can't put it in the sewer fund. You can't put it in the general fund. You can't put it in road use tax fund. It has to, you have to create a new account and you have to call it something like, you know, the city tip fund or whatever. So it goes in that special fund. A uh, little statistics for you. According to the league, there's 338 cities in Iowa that use tip. And 49 out of the 50 states in, the United, in this country have some kind of a tip program. So it's widely used and it's very popular. Uh, let's go to the history of tip to know how this all came about. In the 1960s, a lot of cities, you concluded, were doing big urban renewal projects, especially downtown. And somebody came up with the idea of, you know, we're getting these federal grants to help with these big urban renewal projects, but we don't have any local money. To do. Somebody came up with a brainstorm. Uh, maybe it was Bob Johnson. He would have been around that. I don't know. And they created what is called the Urban Renewal Law. Later, I'm going to talk to you about a different kind of urban, uh, urban revitalization. But my my youngest remembrance of remember you see that big town clock flying down <laughs> down to Butte? That was all part of a big urban renewal effort back in the 1960s. And uh, this is about the time that there was a lot of federal grants for that sort of thing. Uh, a couple other things happened in 1968 that made TIF possible. The first one was. There was a Supreme Court justice named Dillon, I think his name is the Iowa Supreme Court justice. And basically this Iowa Supreme Court came down with a decision that said, you know what cities, if the law doesn't allow you to do it, you can't do it, period, period. If the law doesn't give you the right to do that, you are not gonna do that. Um, in 1968, with a game changer for cities in Iowa, we got what was called home rule. And in home rule, it reversed that, it said, Unless it specifically prohibits a city from doing it, you can do it with a few minor exceptions, most of which was taxation. Okay, you, you got you got things out there that, uh, for example, I know the city that has a skating rink years ago before home rule, you couldn't have a skating rink. Uh, that doesn't that was not in the code, but because home rule switched all that, you can do that now. And you could also maybe have paid for that in skating rink, but skating rink maybe tip money. No, so the uh, the good thing about home rule was it made it possible. It, it, it really opened up the doors in a lot of things. So, so the next slide, and that is uh, in 1986, um, another big change took place. 1986, the Code of Iowa was changed to say that economic development at work financing is a public purpose. Prior to 1986. You would have not given a grant to an industry to uh, build a new building or a TIF rebate to a new industry. You would have not given a grant to a developer to put in a residential subdivision. Totally outlawed. You couldn't have done it because economic development was a private thing. Now they switched around and said, well, economic development could be a public purpose, which then expanded the scope of, of TIF to allow to you know, take a bare piece of land now and really do something with it. And then once a building gets built, generate the TIF money, 
And now you can use the TIF money to pay the debt back. So it really changed the, the scope of things. Okay, we'll go on to the next slide, 1995. Now the legislature is watching all this and saying, oh, wait a minute, it's getting a little out of hand here. Um, you know, these TIF districts, they shouldn't go on forever. So they put a time limit on them. Uh, the other thing is they want to start seeing how you're spending that money. So now suddenly a lot more paperwork come into play for those of you who are city clerks. And the other key thing that came into play was called anti piracy rules in 2010, <laughs> where one city can't port a business in another city and say, you know what? We'll give you a TIF uh, rebate or a TIF grant if you move your business over to our city uh, and so evidently that had been taking place. And so the legislature said, whoa, wait a minute, that's not what we intended for TIF. And so now if you're going to do something like that, you either get the approval of the city that business is located. Well, no city's going to say, oh yeah, come on over, steal all my businesses. That's not going to happen. Or the other thing is the business is saying, if you don't do this, first is plain leaving the whole state of Iowa. Well, that's a little bit of a game changer. So the guy that piracy thing is there's a few little loopholes that in case you ever go down that road, but that's a whole other stuff. Okay, what's the purpose of TIF? Next slide. The number one purpose right from the start, which is why TIF was enacted in my opinion, is slum and blight removal. There was a lot of cities out there. I actually, my very first city I worked in, Fort Madison. That was their whole thing. A number of uh, areas that were really uh, the properties were were not well kept, and some of them were abandoned. Some a lot of them were sitting empty. So we used TIP in um, in Fort Madison years ago to do slum and blight removal, and a lot of cities in the state did that. The other thing that uh, TIF can be used for is to generate money for new infrastructure, particularly street, water, and sewer, to help open up a development in an area. And the way it works, of course, is you borrow the money to put in the street, water, and sewer, and then new houses, new buildings get built. That generates new taxes. You capture that tax money, put it in your TIF fund, and then you use that to pay off the debt that was incurred as a result of putting in that street, water, and sewer. Now, the other thing that has been used for in a few places, I'm curious if it's public improvements. I actually know of a city out there that built most of City Hall with TIF money. Now that's a stretch because that's not what TIF was originally intended for. I know of a few cases out there that um, they got a bonding attorney to say, yep, you can use TIF money to put in a public works building. I really don't think, that, and, and so there are not a lot of those examples, but I'm just curious, how many of you have used TIF money to build a building like a city hall or a public works building or a library? So nobody here, okay. Uh, the ones that I'm most familiar with are down in the Iowa City, Quad Cities area. So they have kind of abused TIF, in my opinion, but that's just my personal opinion, which is why then the legislature always pays attention to what the TIF is being used for. But uh, you have to prove now that, that with this law that you have to show there's no other way to pay for it. There just really wasn't another alternative. You're also supposed to be able to prove that it's related to economic development, which can be a real stretch sometimes. So, so what are the common uses of TIF? So the next slide, and that is, you can use it to remove dilapidated buildings. If you have a number of buildings in your community that are just <clears throat> need to come down, they're eyesores and the property owners have long since abandoned it, TIF might be a possibility for you to look at. The basic infrastructure I talked about, in fact, that's where the bulk of TIF money in Iowa has been spent. In fact, 54% of it has gone towards basic infrastructure projects. Um, the development, redevelopment of an area uh, is another use that's for economic development projects, you know, getting an industry or a business to come to your community. And then the public buildings, which we've already kind of already talked about. But the key thing in there, as I said, you've got to make a connection between that public building and, and uh, economic development, which is a real stretch. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Before I get too deep into TIF, I think it's important for you to know that there is another creature out there called tax abatement. And there are some people confuse the two. Totally different, okay? Get the mindset, not the same thing. Totally different, okay. TIF was created 
by chapter 403 of the Code of Iowa. And the person who then builds that new building, they pay their taxes, just like anybody else does. They pay their taxes. And you also then declare an urban renewal area. And that urban renewal area then, and an urban renewal plan that you put together, allows you to capture that new tax money, or at least most of it. Now, tax abatement, that was created by Chapter 404 of the Code of Iowa, and that is created by something slightly different name, and this is where the confusion comes in. Tax abatement means you have to have an urban revitalization plan and an urban revitalization district. So I think what throws a lot of people off is they both start out with the name urban, okay? Two totally different things. The other important thing that you need to wear, if you don't remember much else besides the bonding attorney thing and this, and that is it's best not to mix and match the two, okay? Use one or use the other. There are a few cities out there that have used both, but it's complicated and um, I wouldn't recommend it. And occasionally you're going to run into someone that says, oh, why can't we do a tax abatement and tip both? They're two, they're kind of diabolically opposed to each other. And I'll explain more about that later. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. And that is um, tax increment financing versus tip. Tax abatement basically uh, says we're not going to add value right away. Therefore, the person is not going to pay their taxes. <laughs> they're not going to be writing a check out for property taxes in a TIF abatement situation. Unlike TIF, they pay their taxes, but now we get to capture it. Basically, the word abated, that's the key thing here. Taxes are abated for a specified period of time by a specified amount, okay? Whereas TIF, taxes are actually paid, but they might be rebated back to the individual that paid the taxes. So uh, once again, keep in mind, abatement, no tax paid, rebate, they pay their tax, it comes back. Seldom do you use these together. Okay. Go to the next slide. What are the benefits? If it's tax abatement, the taxpayer, the owner of the buildings, probably gets a better deal, okay? Because let's say you can actually have tax abatement that's 100% abating the taxes. Whereas TIF, you can't go to 100% that route. But that, it can be a real incentive to build a new building, knowing that I'm getting this, bit, while I'm trying to get this building paid for, I'm not going to have to pay any property taxes for a period of time. So it's a good deal. TIF, on the other hand, might be to the city's advantage because you capture that money. They paid their taxes and you capture a good portion of it and it goes into your special city fund. And then you can use that for a number of eligible projects. So it, Gives the city a lot more flexibility. So it's always amazing how many cities don't even consider the option of tax abatement. Uh, so how many of you do tax abatement? One, oh, a few, yeah. Okay. So I'm curious. Have you? Are they in the same areas? They were last it's citywide. Citywide. Yeah. Okay. Citywide mm -hmm. as well. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. So the uh, there are a few cities out there that I know that have done both. The tax abatement process, here's how you put it together. And then I'm going to move on. You've got to have an urban revitalization plan that talks about why you're doing this and how you're going to use the money. Uh, there's a handout in the packet. Um, that I copied it off the league's website, talks about tax abatement, what you have to do to put one together. Uh, the other thing is, it, and it could be also a countywide thing too. So the Board of Supervisors would need to approve it. Uh, the council needs to approve it, um, and so it's it's a it's a very detailed step by step process. Once again, get your bonding attorney involved before you attempt to do this sort of thing. Okay, here's where the tricky part comes in. There are different tax abatement scales. It can really be confusing. Okay, one rule of thumb to remember though is whatever the state law says, that's the maximum you can do tax abatement. You can do anything lower than that, but you cannot exceed what that is in chapter 404 and chapter 427 uh, of the Code of Iowa. So always keep that in mind. Could be less, but can never be greater. You can do one of two things. You can have a fixed abatement, the same percentage, 
for a set number of years, or you can have a sliding scale. For example, I think one of the options is, uh, um, for example, with commercial, uh, it can be 100% for a period of time, uh, or then you can go to a sliding scale and it starts out at 80% year one and then down to, you know, 60, 70, down to, you know, something like 20 or 25% in the last year. So you can pick any one of those options that you have. Uh, the next step, uh, slide talks about the, um, all the different kinds of tax benefit scales that are out there. You've got the industrial one. If you do an industrial one, most cities probably don't. Uh, 427B.3 comes back. Right, you're behind. You're behind. You're behind. I can't see it. Okay. Yeah, go to the next slide. You're good. Okay. There you go. There you go. So, industrial is one. Okay, commercial. <laughs> There's a commercial one where three years of 100%, which would be quite an, quite an incentive to someone putting in a new business. First three years, I pay no property taxes. Uh, and then you can go to, to a 10 year one where it scales down, as you see. Now, a lot of cities probably do the residential tax abatement to encourage people to build new, new houses in your community. <laughs> and so there's various ways of doing that too. And the last one, of course, that I talked about was slum and blight removal. And uh, you can see an 80 to 20% or 100% for five years. And the interesting thing about slum and blight is you can go out 15 years and have that sliding scale all the way down. And so if you do tax abatement, you, want, you obviously want to read those chapters. And then you also want to get your uh, bonding attorney involved. Last thing I'm going to leave with you, tax abatement, is it, it is complicated, okay? The first time you look at it, it's like, oh man, this is overwhelming. I'll never understand how this works. Don't feel bad. <laughs> a lot of people have the same thought. But it is the potential to encourage housing construction, potential to include residential, commercial development. Uh, it can do those things, but always use a bond return. Those of you who have raised your hand, how have, why have you done tax abatement before? Well, it's just aging property in the first place and incentivizing or at least marketing the yeah. idea that if you're adding something or improving property, it's at least one incentive to do so. Okay. Um, Is it residential and commercial and all of those? It's residential. Okay. But um, it also touches multifamily residential. And the scale is larger and longer. Okay. And down by the American sure if you're there, down where Heidi Dollar Precious and okay. Coconut. So there's about four acres of space and the company wants to do senior multifamily residential because the infrastructure was already there. Yeah. They found the abatement schedule to be okay. a larger benefit than would be logical by yeah. TIP anyway. So it, would be. it was a tool for us to continue talking outside of TIP. Oh, good. So okay. that's what about Manchester? What do you use for that? Um, ours was primarily to encourage housing, uh, multifamily, residential, okay. and then um, we had some new subdivisions too, yeah. where we didn't necessarily want to utilize TIF. Um, so urban revitalization is what we implemented, and um, we allowed them to choose which um, which scale they want to use. Oh, they, the, they have the option. Yeah, oh, that's good. Yeah, we've opened it up that's to them good. to utilize that. So and it's worked well. Um, oh, good. The developers seem to like it. Okay. Now, if somebody else raised their hand on tax. <laughs> I did. Oh, okay. We used it to correct the developer okay. for senior housing. Okay. okay. So, so for a senior housing project. Yes. Oh, okay. Good. All right. So all good examples. So you got three of them there. If your city ever wants to do one of those. Okay. Let's go back to tip. Next slide. Um, one of the things you can use tip for, as I mentioned, is the critical infrastructure to start economic development activities in your communities, uh, to, to encourage a, a new business to uh, build something. You can also use it to um, you know, get a company to enlarge the building, add some new jobs to the community. Obviously, you want it, one of the things you really want it to do is increase your property values. And uh, that's why we had that, I asked Mickey that question before, did, did, did TIF get impacted by this legislation? Uh, because when you use TIF, and if everything falls in the place where you want it to, you should then increase your property values, which then is helpful to the county and helpful to the school. And then once you, you pay off the debt to pay for that infrastructure, or whatever you did to encourage economic development, now that TIF comes off 
and it expires. And now you've got this new money that you didn't have before rolling into the general fund and into the school fund and the county fund. So sometimes it takes a few years, but hopefully the end result is everybody's happy. You know, more money to work with because we increase property values. The other little side note that sometimes people forget, and that is if you get a new business account, like I see a few small towns where they do something to encourage uh, a new Casey's or a new Dollar General store. See those little Dollar General stores popping up all over? If TIP was used to do that, that increased your sales tax revenue in your town, <laughs> which then if you've got the local office sales tax money, added to that because anytime you put in a business like Dollar General Casey's, you're going to add to your sales tax rate, unless the legislature gets greedy and takes it all away. <laughs> okay. All right. How do you do one of these tip things? What's the basic steps? Once again, this packet has a great little handout that I borrowed from John Danos, which John did not copyright. He gave me permission to put it in his handout. Okay. Long time ago. Uh, basic things you need to do to get this in place. Number one, identify and Lay out a plan for what the project is going to consist of. Put it in writing. Then once you've got that plan describing what you're going to do, and, and John talks about what that's in, in that plan, you need to um, adopt an urban renewal plan. Okay, Very first step, write and adopt an urban renewal plan. And in that plan, you're going to declare an area, an urban renewal area. In, you're probably going to have a legal description. You might even have a map in the plan that's going to say, this part of our community is now an urban renewal area. Now that makes you eligible to start using, you know, generating temp money for various projects. Now, let's go to the next slide. Keep this, this rule of thumb in place. No urban renewal plan, no TIF money. Okay, So don't just think we're going to create a TIF district tomorrow and we're going to get all this money for it. You got to have a plan and you got to follow chapter 403 to the letter. Okay. The last thing you want to do is um, start getting ahead of yourself and, and miss one of the steps in the process and then have some citizen out there that thinks, man, I'm 403. I'm going to read 403 and say what Sigma says because we all have these crackpots in town. <laughs> We're just waiting for you to make mistakes. Okay. So you don't want to be the one to make that first mistake. Okay. <laughs> You want to make sure you do all the right things. You need to define the purpose of your plan. You need to define what the objectives are. Why are you doing this in the first place? Now, this is important for you to share uh, with some people in, that aren't maybe actively uh, uh, involved with the city. I have, and later I'm going to talk about this. I think it's critical you let your state legislators know what you're doing and why you're doing it. What is the objective here? And then tell them. Boy, what a great tool fit is. The other thing is let your board of supervisors know what you're doing and why you're doing it and how in the long term it's going to help the county as well as the city. Okay. And the same with the school district. So make sure you have good objectives and good purpose. Okay. You got the urban renewal plan in place. The area is clearly established. You have identified the improvements that are going to take place. Now, this is the one change that, uh, that in the law that uh, uh, if you've been in TIF for a long time, maybe you weren't aware of this, but you really got to define what the improvement is going to be in your plan now. So if you have an old urban renewal plan sitting in the office and you think, oh, we're covered. We got an urban renewal plan. We're good to go. Pull that plan out. See how long ago it was written and, and see if it mentions specific projects in detail. Because if it doesn't, your plan has to be updated before you can start getting tip money. So it's got to be very specific where you show what the improvements are and list specific projects. And Mr. Danos feels you should include cost estimates too, as best you can. So make sure you've got as much detail in that plan before you start going after your, the tip money. Okay, next slide. Now, the Planning and Zoning Commission has a role to play in this too. Now, you might say, well, they only do rezonings and you know, that sort of thing. Well, the code says you've got to at least show this to your planning and zoning commission. Now, they don't, they can't vote it down. They can't say, oh, we don't like it, we vote no. They, they don't have any veto power. But you have to show the courtesy of showing them that, yes, indeed, 
we're going to do this planning and zoning. You need to talk about it. Give us some advice if you want to give us advice. That's yeah, fine. The other thing is you have to have a consultation with your school uh, folks and the county folks. You send them a letter. You tell them what the, the plan is, why you're doing this. You invite them in to meet with you. And uh, once again, one of the things I've done in this is packet is I've got a, uh, a kind of a timetable on this whole process and all the different steps of when you want to do this. You do, you give them the opportunity from the school and the county to tell you what they think. They do not have veto power. So if the school board comes in and says, this is the dumbest idea I've ever seen, don't do it. The board of supervisors says, I can't believe you're doing this. Dumb idea, doesn't make any difference. <clears throat> as long as the city council thinks it's a good idea, it can happen, but they have to be consulted. And then, of course, like everything else in the state of Iowa, we got to do a public hearing. So you'll do a public hearing. One of the interesting things that I find that very few county officials or very few city officials ever ask a city, and that is this. And I think it's a fair question you should ask yourselves, and it's nowhere in the law. And that question is, what if no TIF money went into this project? Would it still take place? I can't imagine why school officials don't say, you know what? What if you didn't do TIF? Was it going to take, was that developer going to do it anyway? So did we give away the store for something we really didn't need to? I don't know. It's a fair question to ask. Uh, I, as, as, since I retired and watched other cities over the, over the years, I often wonder, could they have gotten that project without TIF? Because I'm actually talking to someone right now that uh, a private individual has called me and I said, I want to know, hey, I hear you know a lot about TIP. I said, well, <laughs> I'll send you my handouts. And I said, let me tell me this, sir. Were you going to do this project regardless? Well, yeah, I would do it regardless, but I want some TIP money. <laughs> oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> Keep that in mind as you contemplate these various projects. Did you really have to do it or not? I don't know. That's the one you have to make. So anyway, let's go to the next slide. You've got the urban renewal process all done. Plans in place, jump through all the hoops. You've got everything done that you need to do. Okay. you got to make sure that those projects and improvements that you do are consistent with your plan. And if they're not consistent, you go back and you amend the plan and you start all over. Okay? Go through the same steps again. But you amend it as needed, and then you finally adopt it by resolution. Now, the other thing... I didn't put in this note that I had as, as I was rereading, um, rereading one of the handouts. And the funny thing about TIP is I've been doing this for years and years. This is one I overlooked. And that is you need a comprehensive plan too before you do urban renewal. Now, those of you who did TIP, I'm sure you all know that. Uh, but it's, it's one of those things we tend to overlook because I've always had a comprehensive plan. <laughs> Never had a city that didn't have a comprehensive plan. But there's a few cities out there, if you don't have a comprehensive plan, you got to do that first before you get into all this. So do make a mental note of that because it's something I've overlooked over the years because I've never had to worry about it. I just had a comprehensive plan. Okay, so the next thing you have to determine is what type of urban renewal plan we're going to have. So let's go to the next slide. And that is, which of these areas is going to be our primary focus? Is it going to be slum and blight removal? Is it be commercial industrial development? Is it going to be LMI housing? And for those of you who are not familiar with TIP, LMI stands for low and moderate income housing. These are folks that live in housing. Uh, their, their medium income is, was it 80%, I think, below the medium income. So they, you can use money for that. You can also use it for housing that's non-LMI. Now, I know, Makoba, you've got a LMI project because you did those little, the little houses. Yeah, yeah. And that's an LMI project, right? Yeah. That's where you probably used to tip money there. Right? Yeah. 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 Great example of using tip money for LMI housing. Uh, great example in Makoba. Or the other thing, you can mix and match. You can, you, you can have it for more than one of these things that we just listed. But to, to know what all these things mean, mean, particularly the definition of slum, blight, you need to read chapter 403.2. That will tell you what we mean by all these different categories. Okay, you've got the urban renewal plan in place. For the next slide, you have to create a TIF district. 
here's where some of the confusion comes in. You've got an urban renewal area, okay? That was created with your plan. Now, the next step is you declare a district in the urban renewal area, a TIF district. You can't do that until the area has been declared and the plan has been approved. Now, you, cre you create the TIF district by ordinance, okay? A little confusing. Urban renewal plan is approved by a resolution. Got that all done. Got the urban renewal area. It's usually a bigger area. Now, by an ordinance, you create a TIF district with a legal description. You describe the area, and now you file that with the county. You file that with your county auditor. And later, you're going to hear me talk about the importance of having a good working relationship with that county auditor and consider that county auditor a member of your team when it comes to TIF. So you'll file that with the county. A couple of the key things, differences. Let's go to the next slide, and that is... What's the difference between a TIF district and an urban renewal area? That is a hard concept for people to understand, okay? And the best way I can explain it to you is that a TIF district can be a little bit smaller area than an urban renewal area. It can be, but it has to be within the urban renewal area. You can have multiple TIF districts within one urban renewal area, okay? Many of them. Um, in Anamosa, I have, I have more than one TIF district within our one urban renewal area. Um, or you can have that match the boundaries exactly. You could have one urban renewal area, and then the TIF district covers the entire area. You can do that as well. So, but keep in mind, there are two distinct things. The urban renewal area kind of gets you set up. That's the umbrella over everything. Then the TIF district, then now you're getting into detail the specifics of saying, that TIF district, we're going to use the money for this, and now we want that TIF money coming in. So, uh, and then once you, here's the key thing too. Once you preempt that TIF district, the clock starts running. Okay, because there's limits on how long you can have these TIF districts. If you don't create the TIF district, that urban renewal area can go on for quite some time. But once you set up the TIF district, now the clock is running. So, um, the concept I mentioned, the urban renewal area is your umbrella that oversees everything. And uh, like I said, it could be the same, but that urban renewal area is the one that's in your plan. And the key rule of thumb here, a TIF district has to be in an urban renewal area or plan absolutely all the time. So there's no exceptions there. Okay, now how do you get your hands on that TIF money? And that's our next slide, okay? <clears throat> You've done all the right stuff. You've got your urban renewal area. You've got the TIF district now created by ordinance. How do I get some of that money that we're going to do some stuff with? The very first thing you have to do is incur some kind of debt. If let's say you uh, you got the TIF district all set up and people start paying their taxes and the money is coming in. If you haven't incurred some kind of debt or obligation, you can't have that money. That money will flow to the to the general fund in the city, school, and county. Once you incur an obligation or a debt, and this could be a general obligation bond, it could be a TIF revenue bond, it could be a, a contract that you have with someone where you have a contractual obligation to pay something. You've incurred the debt, now you certify it to the county, okay? Basically the county auditor again. You're gonna certify that you now have incurred debt which now makes you eligible for TIF money. So now you can start claiming some of that TIF money and have it start coming into the city. Once you get that TIF money, once again, it goes into a special fund, and then you use that money to pay the debt. I think most of you, uh, Trisha, should you take that TIF money and transfer it to the, the debt service levy? Yeah, so money flows into the TIF fund, then you take that money and you transfer it to the debt service fund, which then, uh, is used to pay the debt. And the debt then was something that you incurred as an improvement in that TIF district. Okay. Any questions so far? I hope those of you who are new at this, are you following it? That's okay. making sense to you? Yeah. What if all of our TIFs are internal loans? Yeah. So are, are we you still, would I still transfer it to the debt? Or where am I supposed to be transferring it to? Well, you have general obligation bonds. We do. Yeah. We don't have internal loans, so I can't speak. I guess yeah. they are different. Would I? I had an internal loan. 
Yes. Okay. You tra transfer it back to whatever fund you took in. Yes, so exactly. You borrow the money from franchise fees, then in your exactly. contract, you're going to place that you're going to put the money back in your yeah. franchise. Yeah. When you repay exactly. the resolution, the debt resolution. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry about. Exactly. Debt resolution. Yep. Okay. That created the issue. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Other questions. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's go to um, go to the next slide. Um, well, kind of a lead into that last discussion. Okay. What kind of debt are we talking about? It could be a typical blank loan. Uh, it's probably going to be backed with the uh, full faith and credit of the city, but where we issue it as a general obligation loan. It could be a general obligation bond issue. Well, that's the other thing. Or the internal debt that she's just talking about, where you, you know, those of you with electric utilities, um, usually that electric utility has a little more money to work with. Uh, Preston, I know, has an electric utility. Uh, have you ever borrowed from that collection? We actually borrowed from gas. Or gas or well, you got both. Yes. Lucky town, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, most of you don't have the luxury of a gas and electric utility. So um, anyway, you now incurred the debt from that that fund. So you got to pay it back. And it should have been done by using a resolution. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then she will then pay back that electric or gas utility fund. Okay. You may have a developer's agreement in which you told the developer, you do this, we will then capture the money from your new taxes that you start paying, and we're going to give a piece of it back to you. We're going to give some of that tax money back as a, as a, uh, as a I guess, a thank you for doing a development in our town. And we'll talk more about that later. For the other uh, entity out there that I, uh, few cities have used, but very few, and that is you can actually issue what is called a TIF revenue bond or a TIF revenue loan. Has anybody done it? I didn't think so. There's not much of an advantage to doing it because it does count against your debt limit, unlike a water and sewer revenue loan. And so there's really little or no advantage to doing it. If you ever have a financial advisor tell you, well, let's issue a TIF revenue loan, question them and say, why would we do that instead of a GO loan? Okay. Uh, so be very careful if anybody says you that's the thing to do, but it is legal and it has been done in few cases. Okay, how much money do you actually get? Let's talk, let's look at that TIF revenue, TIF levy formula. As I mentioned, the individual who built that new building in your TIF district is paying all the taxes now, just like all of us are paying the same taxes that we all are. Okay. And I said you're going to get a lot, a lot of that money. From the city, you're not going to get it all. Okay, that's why you got to keep in mind is okay. I'm not going to get a hundred percent of that money they they just paid in in taxes. But here's what I have to subtract. You take the maximum levy. That's called the, the consolidated levy. Consolidated levy is school, county, city. That whole big levy that we all pay when we pay our property taxes. You subtract from it for levies for debt service. Not only your debt service as a city, but the county and the school debt service levies. The school has what is called a physical plant and equipment levy or PEPL as they call it. That comes off the top. They also have a school instructional support levy. That comes off the top. And what is left is what is called, I call the TIF levy. That's how much money you're gonna get. One of the last things I gave you the handout and it didn't get on there. <laughs> okay. Um, well, there was is it in the other one? Hand it might be in the other one. Yeah, it's the calculation. Oh, that is, that is oh, here we go. Perfect. Thank you. I, I didn't know you had two separate lines. You're keeping me on my okay. That's the third. This is I put this in here so you can see. This is our, I think this is my last year of city administrator in Anamosa. This is what the levy the map consolidated levy is the top levy, okay. You then subtract all those things. Debt service. Does everybody have this, by the way? It's the very last page. Okay. It shows you then debt service, school, county, city, temple, school, all those things. They're all subtracted. And then your net levy is um, the, after you subtract all those things. So in this case, the AM, that was Anamosa's example. And then I put a little town in there. That was Owen's example. So you can see 
Anamosa had a chip levy basically of 3181, and Sol Olin had one of uh, 33. Your number is going to vary. Uh, it just depends on what the consolidated levy is. This is all information you can get from the county auditor. Okay. The county auditor will have that levy for you. That might have been might even be on their website. Uh, where you can just kind of go in there and, and see what those levies are. Yeah. The Department of Management, I think, if I remember right, has all those levies too. Mm -hmm. if I remember. So the numbers are out there, and you just have to kind of see what your numbers look like in your exam. So uh, let's see. Let's go to the next slide, and that is the sunset provisions. It's very important you don't forget about the fact that these tip districts, they don't go on forever, okay? There will come a time. Now, you may have moved on and you are no longer city clerk, <laughs> so when some of them expired, I guarantee Josh, all my tip districts have long since expired because the uh, folk in the newspaper had my name in your yesteryears this past week. My brother sent me a picture. Uh, it was 30 years ago, right now, where I said, the hell with you, Makoka, I'm moving on. <laughs> I'm burned out. I got enough. <laughs> so I left the city manager's job in Makoka 30 years ago, last month or something. After April, I'm sorry, it's April. So anyway, that all of my tip districts have long since expired. Okay. All the ones that I was involved with are long since expired. So here's what you got to keep in mind. <clears throat> if it was set up prior to 1995, I don't think they changed that law. They're they were kind of grandfathered in. So I don't know. How many of you have something that was set up before 1995? Anybody? Oh, man. Is this still going on? Yeah. Is it we have, really? I think at least one. That's just oh, is it? Yeah. One. So you got one holdout out there. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, commercial, industrial, they've got a 20 year limit. Residential housing, the law basically says 10 years is your limit. However, depending on which bonding attorney you talk to, sometimes Depending on the timing of your TIF district, they can squeeze out an 11 year time. I don't know how they do it, but if, if, if you're working with a bonding attorney and tell them, yes, I know the law is 10, but is there some way we can squeeze out another year? Just ask them. So, uh, slum and blight removal, unless the law has changed, they have, there's no sunset provision there. So that's your sole focus is slum and blight removal. That's a good thing. Bottom line is consult that bonding attorney to make sure that you are have a clear understanding of when that tip district starts and when it ends. And um, it's critical that you know that because the example I use is if you are going to get tip for 10 years, let's say to help pay for water and sewer in a residential area, you're not going to want to go out and issue a 15-year geo bond. Okay. Because at the end of 10 years, you have no TIF money coming in. How do you retire the last five years of that 15 year old GO bond? Taxpayer, the average taxpayer has to pay the bill now. So you don't want that to happen. You can avoid it. So um, let's go to the next slide. And that is sunset provisions. Um, cities under 15,000, you have that 10, maybe 11 year option. Um, now, there is a little known section of the law that says that if your school board and your county board of supervisors give you the okay, you can go out another five years. Now, you're going to have to be a really good salesperson on that and make a very convincing argument why that's a good idea before both the school board and the county are going to buy on to that. Most of the time, they're going to say, no, uh, we really need that money. Uh, no, we're not going to give you the green light to extend that tip district because we want that money to start flowing into the county and school general fund. Key thing, make sure you read section 403.22 very, very carefully on these sunset provisions. Okay. And we have no city uh, over 15,000, so I'm not gonna worry about talking about that. Okay. Oh, the sunset clock. Um, it is critical. It will start running once you create the TIF district, okay? And so keep that in mind. And when the money starts flowing in, you're gonna get 10 years or whatever the, the magic number is. I cannot stress to you enough the importance of checking with your county auditor to make sure what, what your expectations are match up with what the county auditor's expectations are. Because the last thing you wanna do is think you've got another year or two of TIF money coming in 
and then have the county auditor say, oh, no, that expired last year. You're, you're not going to take money this year. That's, that's done. So you want to make sure you and the county auditor are on the same page, and you also want to make sure that you're on the same page with your bonding attorney. So, okay, getting back to the next, go to the next slide, and that's the type of, of TIF debt or obligations you can have. Uh, first one I'll mention, I already talked about, and that is a TIF revenue loan. Once again, very unlikely you're going to do that. This is the most likely one you're going to use, a general obligation loan paid off with TIF money, okay? You're going to incur a general obligation loan or bond issue to pay for some improvement, or in my case, now most of them, against my better judgment, my city council said, you know what? We're going to issue a GO bond. We're going to take that money and we're going to give it as a grant to a person who wants to put in a new residential subdivision, street water sewer. We're going to help him pay for that, which we did. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but uh, that's a possibility as well. The internal loans we talked about, like Preston had. And the other thing we can do is called a TIF rebate agreement. And that is a, an agreement we have with the developer who says, I'm going to build this new building and it's going to employ this many people and it's going to do all these great things and it's going to give you all this tax money. And in this agreement, we agree to rebate back to that individual some of that property tax money. Once again, using, using this uh, page here, the person is in this rebate agreement is going to pay their full taxes just like everybody else but then this bottom number we're going to give all or a portion of that back to the individual as an incentive to do that major project that they just promised you they would do so they can look at it and say you know i'm going to pay i'm going to pay a hundred thousand dollars in property taxes but i'm going to get back about eighty thousand dollars of that after i pay that bill now they uh the thing you got to remember is they got hoops they got to jump through too. Okay, they just it's just it's just automatic. They got to make requests for it. Council's got to pass resolutions, and so there's a number of things that you need to do. So, but it is a way to dangle that carrot out there for the developer, saying if you do this project, once you pay your taxes, we're going to give you a chunk of it back, and then you can take that money to help pay for the improvements that you just put in. So. It's a way to encourage economic development. Let's go to the next slide. This is another one of those key things where if you didn't use a bonding attorney, your local city attorney would probably miss this one. Okay. And if you first, for example, if you, let's say you didn't use a bonding attorney and you had your local attorney do all this stuff, make sure they know what an annual appropriation clause is. Now, does anyone here use annual appropriation clauses? Most of you. All right. What that is, is it basically is in the agreement and it says to the developer that we're going to give you that money every year if you pay your taxes. But every year, the council has to pass a resolution appropriating the money so that, you know, it's made legal and it's made part of the budget. If for some reason the future council says, you know what, change my mind, I don't think we want to do that. They could actually say no, and the person would not get the tip rebate. Has anyone ever heard of the city ever doing that? I haven't either. <laughs> I've been tempted to tell a couple of cities they should do it, but I never have. Anyway, the reason that's so important is because if you do not have an annual appropriation clause in that agreement, the full value of the trip rebate for the entire length of time counts against your geo debt capacity. And I tell cities, you look upon that geo debt capacity as a precious commodity that you just don't willy nilly give away because you may need it as a city to issue a bond for something else down the road, like a street project or a new fire station or a new swimming pool. And if you've issued all these rebate agreements and you didn't have these appropriation clauses in there, your bonding attorney is gonna look at your debt limit and say, uh, you gave away your debt capacity to all these other agreements. Uh, you don't have the debt capacity now to issue a new bond issue for that, that new uh, public works building, or whatever it may be. With the annual appropriation clause, only the annual amount counts against the debt. So that is a key factor that you always got to keep in mind is make sure that all of your agreements 
have that in there. And if your developer says, well, I, I, I don't want that, just say it's a deal breaker. <laughs> We're not going to do it without it because of the impact that's going to have. Because I can guarantee you, if you make an exception for one developer, the next one's going to want the same exception. And he's going to say, well, you didn't put it in the last agreement. Why are you going to have it in my agreement? So you need to have a hard and fast rule. Always have an annual appropriation clause so it doesn't hurt your debt capacity. Now, these are contractual obligations that you've now entered into, uh, which then now makes you eligible for TIP money. So you then let the county auditor you know you made those. Um, another key thing that maybe isn't necessarily related to TIP, but that is a lot of this stuff takes time to put it all together. And maybe some of the projects you're working on are getting started. In order to make sure that they're eligible for uh, debt-free financing, you need what to you need to pass a re reimbursement resolution saying basically to the world, yeah, we're, we're going to issue a geo bond once we get this all put together and all done and we're doing interim financing. But in the end, our, our intent is to use a tax exempt uh, bond or a tax exempt loan to pay for all this. If you have that reimbursement resolution in place, you have preserved the ability to issue tax exempt financing. And by that, I mean, when the bonds are issued, they can be one of two things. The people who pay, or who give you the money and loan you the money, when they get their interest, if you have a tax exempt issue, they're not paying any, in, any income tax, the federal level, no income tax. If you screw up and don't do these things, they now have a loan that's getting interest and they got to pay tax on it. They don't want that. And because they don't want that, your interest rate's going to hide, be higher. So it's going to cost the city more money in the end. That's why I said make sure you have a good bonding attorney so you get a true tax exempt loan or bond. Because if you don't, the city will pay higher interest. So just a little side. Note. But that's a whole other subject besides tip. Okay, let's go to the uh, what I call the dark side of tip, okay? And that is when you do tip you will impact the general fund. Because if you didn't do TIP and the building gets built, that's money that would have gone to your general fund. And with, with, with what the state legislature has done and making things tighter and tighter, you gotta be thinking about that in this day and age. So um, the other thing you gotta keep in mind that I just spoke about, and that is the impact on your constitutional debt limit. Because you are gonna be issuing bonds to do some of this stuff. That bond is going to have an impact on your, your geo debt capacity and ability to do other projects down the road. And never, ever forget the next statement. If they don't build what they say they're going to build, you're not going to get any tip money. The only way you get tip money is new construction. So no new construction, no new tip money. You can have jumped through all the great, all the hoops and done all the right stuff, with perfect according to the law, and then your developer goes bankrupt, goes belly up doesn't build any of the stuff that they said they were gonna build. You don't get any tip money because they're not paying taxes. So always remember that, no construction, no tip money. Uh, another thing is uh, something called minimum assessment agreements that you can put in there. It does provide some protection to the city <laughs> that if, let's say, for example, they pledge they're gonna do this, uh, and let, let's, let's say they're, they tell you they're gonna build a million dollar building. And you do the math and you think, man, that's a lot of money coming in in taxes with that million dollar building. And let's say halfway into the project, they thought, oh man, uh, there's been a change. Um, we're not going to be putting out as much product. We're going to cut the building in half. We're only going to build half the size of the building. That could happen. Well, if there was a minimum assessment agreement in place, at least they would have pledged to you, this is how much money we're going to pay. Now, there is a drawback with these minimum assessment agreements, and not every city uses them, and that it could impact, impact the tax exempt financing of your issue if it's got this little special clause in here, minimum assessment agreement. Once again, a bonding attorney can show you the pros and cons of doing that. And so, once again, if you didn't have a good bonding attorney, well, first of all, this might not even come up as an option. And if it does come up, you need to know What's the trade offs here if you do that sort of thing? How many of you have minimum assessment agreements in your some of your agreements? Did you, <laughs> Manchester? Okay. Yeah. Did it affect your financing? 
It didn't affect the financing, but we've had a couple of the industries, one in particular, yeah. uh, a few years down the road, contest the minimum assessment oh, really? agreement with the assessor. Oh. Um, and that's led to a couple of little hiccups. Did it go to court at all? Uh, I think it did with the assessor. Yeah. And I think they won, actually. And so oh, they probably industry did. Oh, really? It makes you wonder then how bad all these things are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, we were still okay on it because we yeah. were far enough in, but. Yeah, it was kind of an eye opener. Oh, there it was. Yeah. So, good place to call Manchester <laughs> to start getting into these discussions. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, here's another key element. Uh, hey, any questions so far? I know this is a lot to absorb in a short period of time, especially if you're new to tip. So, don't hesitate to ask me a question. Okay. Next little thing, little wrinkle we're going to throw into this is competition to be more. Okay. And that is LMI housing requirement. This applies to a TIP district where the focus is housing, residential TIP. Does not apply to commercial, does not apply to industrial. It only applies to residential TIP. And the state legislature, in their infinite wisdom, said one day, you know what? When they do these residential TIPs, we're going to make them take a piece of that TIP money and use it for low and moderate income housing, like they did in McCoy. Okay, and you have to spend it on something that's going to benefit the low and moderate income housing folks out there. Um, now, this is where your council of governments will get involved. Once again, I'm going to tell you, anytime you do a tip, look upon the council of governments as one of your partners, okay? They have the numbers for you, can tell you what your LMI requirement is going to be. They can also probably help you with the math, I think, Marla, to figure that out. You probably have someone on staff that can hold their hand Not as they do the math something. and determine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Which, by the way, ECI, ECI, I don't know if you know this, I, I travel all over the state, ECI is the best pocket in the whole state. <laughs> they really are. I wouldn't say that it wasn't the case, but I, I work with a lot of them, and ECI is by far the best. So I'm sure there's somebody that can hold your hand and you just say, help me understand this LMI requirement. The other thing that comes into play is you have all these annual reports. So anytime you do TIP, you're going to have to accept the fact that if you're if you're the city clerk or deputy clerk, you're probably going to have a lot more work. Now, it, it, it comes space throughout the year, but you're going to have more work, okay? Um, now, the interesting thing is that um, with an LMI project, you know, I told you before, the project has to be within the urban renewal area and the but not with an LMI project. You can take money from one urban renewal area and spend it in another part of the city on an LMI. So it's one exemption. Uh, so it can be either in or out of the urban renewal area. So let's talk about limitations, restrictions, requirements. The next slide, and that is you will probably face opposition once in a while from your school in your county. Remember I said to you, ask the question, will this project take place without TIF? <laughs> Because I tell you, that's where they're coming from. <laughs> and they're saying, what if you didn't do TIP? But that still take place. That, that's one of the perceptions there. Also, the public perception of TIP. They don't understand it, you know. They haven't been to a workshop like this. So it's a hard thing to wrap their head around. So they don't understand it. Now, the other thing is, don't ever have a huge surplus building up in your TIP funds, okay? Because... That money is supposed to come in and then go out fairly quickly. It's not supposed to be sitting there for five or 10 years. If it is sitting there for five or 10 years, you run the risk of the county auditor saying, wait a minute, I gathered up all that TIF money for you. It's just sitting there, you know, earning interest or whatever. No, no, no. <laughs> I think, I've never seen it done, but I think they could literally force you to give it back to the schools and the county and have it flow into general funds if you're not using it as you're supposed to be using so. But always be mindful then of the sunset provisions too. Okay, the reporting requirements. A lot of reporting requirements. This is gonna now the league, the league has a great handout that's in my packet, and it talks about all these reporting requirements. So before you sign on the dotted line and agree to do all this stuff, look at those reporting requirements to make sure you know what, what you're taking on them. Call a city that has a a um has had a TIF program for a while. Call a city clerk that's been doing these reports. So you kind of get a, an idea of what it involves and what kind of 
uh, paperwork you need to be doing and what kind of records you need to be keeping. Because, boy, the last thing you want to do is get in these TIF projects and not, not have a good set of filing and a good set of records. Because I can tell you, when it comes time to do these reports, if you're organized and you've got this all put together, it's going to make doing those reports a lot easier than trying to pull them all together at the last minute. And there are hard and fast deadlines that you have to be aware of. So that handout does a good job talking about you know, filing your TIF ordinance, filing what is called the TIF indebtedness certificate, saying we borrowed this money, we're going to pay it back with TIF. Here, county auditor, you can see we actually did borrow the money. Here's our verification. And then you have to do uh, an urban renewal um, report. And then you have to put the numbers in your annual financial report. Um, next page. Um, um, and then you've got 1099s. That developer where you gave the money back, good. Got to give them a 1099. Uh, your outstanding debt report. Uh, the Iowa Department of um, Management um, has a reporting system. So all of these things. Um, where do you get help from on some of this stuff? As I mentioned, your county auditor is someone you really need to be, you know, good friends with. Okay, hopefully you've got a good county auditor. I am going to tell you, not all county auditors are alike throughout the state. There are some really good ones, and there are some really poor ones. I hope you have a good one because. That person is a key person in all this stuff. Uh, your auditing firm, whoever does your audits, you know, you should talk, work with them. Your buying attorney. Another good name to get to know is Ted Nielsen, partner manager. He gives a good resource for you. Those of you who have been doing these reports, comments, suggestions, tips that you can share with people that are maybe just getting into it. We were for Sphere Financial for our financing oh, yeah. as well. With Peggy, yeah. Yeah, and they, um, they prepare for us uh, an annual TIP report, which okay. goes over our yeah. um, all of our indebtedness for the city. And yeah. that's a useful tool in preparing a lot of these reports, too, just to compare to my numbers. Yeah. I've seen Maggie's report. She does an excellent job. Yeah. Yeah. Well, any other tips? North on securities, hide and cool, probably the same probably thing. Probably the same She's been good to us. Yeah. That's an interesting thing to bring that up because that's kind of a value added service. Yeah. Uh, some of them don't even charge for under mm -hmm. When you're picking a financial advisor to help you do a geo bond, you might ask them about both their value added services. And you might even go so far as to say, well, I understand Manchester uses Spear and they do this. What do you do? <laughs> so good question to ask those. Folks. <clears throat> Any other tips for people that are looking at doing some of these um, financial reports? Any questions on any of these financial reports? Well, you've got me and people that are doing them here. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, the school district, they are impacted by what you're doing, okay? Now, the state has what is called a backfill for school districts that are, you know, impacted by TIL. Um, the first $5.40 is coming from the state. I think they still do that, right? I don't think they've changed that, but my big concern is that someday, that could change. Okay. The other concern I have is it probably irritates the heck out of those legislators when they have to set aside money to cover this, which is why if they start messing with TIF, this is one of the reasons they might want to do it. The other thing when you're talking to school district folks, be sure to remind them of the fact that they will still get the full amount of their pebble levy and their structural support levy. They'll still get their money to pay off their bonds when they issue them to build the new school. So that money keeps flowing in. Regardless, they, you cannot touch that money. So if you have a new school superintendent and, and maybe had a bad experience with TIF somewhere, do remind them of those two things. Uh, next page is the, um, just a side note here. Some people have used TIF money for water and sewer projects. Have any of you used water and sewer money for TIF projects? Okay, good. <laughs> if you do, uh, it's legal, uh, but uh, talk to your bonding attorney, and follow, you still have to follow all the TIF rules, and but it's a limited value because even though you use TIF money to pay back that uh, that sewer or water revenue loan, legally, technically, you're still your water sewer rates have to be high enough to cover the debt and your operating expenditures, even without the TIF money. So, uh, if anybody ever says to you, Let, "Let's use TIF money to pay for that sewer plant and the water plant," yeah, legally you could do it. 
but it's of limited value in my personal opinion. So once again, a good discussion to have with our Go to the next slide. There is something called the do-over tip. That's where you um, where you have a um, you maybe you've had an area that's been in development for a long time and now it's ended and um, and now you um, maybe something else has come along. So you, you start over and do an undeveloped parcel, but this is not an option for residential. This is only an option for commercial and um, industrial. Once again, it gets pretty complicated. I have never done it, so I can't speak to it, but I do know that it's an animal uh, that I've heard John Daniels talk about that. Yeah, you can do it, but it's called a doable, but you need to do that one. Okay, I mentioned earlier, people on your TIF team, uh, that's my next slide, and that is, once you decide your community is going to get involved in TIF, here's the team of players that you should be reaching out to. Your county <coughs> auditor, your county assessor, your financial advisor, your bonding attorney, uh, your city engineer, uh, ECIA, your regional planning commission, um, at city hall. Obviously, you want the city clerk involved, city manager if you have one. You might at least keep the city attorney advised of what you're doing. So, and then if you have an economic development director, um, mm -hmm. I know uh, I updated my slides the last time I did this. Was Dave Hire said, you don't have the economic development director now. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dave. I'll, I'll make sure I make a plug for the economic development director every time going forward. So the economic development director of your area. Okay, that's your team you want to put together. Um, the 2012 amendments um, kind of covered most of that, but I just a quick highlight. That's where all these reporting requirements came in. So these reporting requirements have been there since 2012. So there's a lot of clerks out there that have been doing it for a lot of years. So uh, reach out uh, and get their help. And there's some penalties if you don't do what you're supposed to do on these reporting requirements. I don't know. I've never heard of a city that's ever gotten penalized, but it's there if it could happen. So um, going on to the next slide, the 2012 amendments, as I mentioned before, uh, if you ever decide to use uh, TIP for these, some of these public buildings, um, you now have to add to your urban renewal plan an analysis of why this is the best option to use. Once again, Mickey's got some good information in the hand on it. And then they got really strict on the end of piracy. Okay, let's go to the next slide. How many of you that said you use TIP have a written policy that says, we have TIF in our community, this is how we propose to use it. Nobody. That, that's, that is pretty typical. Uh, I've done this workshop a number of times. I think I only have one hand go up. <clears throat> you might consider doing it. And, and here's why. You will, every time you do a tip, you set a precedent. Okay? Whether you know it or not, you are setting a precedent. I have worked, I worked on the other side of the table where I have advised developers on what they should and should not do. They've actually called me and said, we're thinking about approaching this city and we're going to do this and this on TIP. How should we approach it? And of course, I'll you know, give them my spiel and I give them my opinion on things too. One of the first things I say to them, have they done TIP before? If they have, what they do? Okay, if you're a smart developer, you're going to go find out what they did before and then say, I should be able to get at least that much, maybe a little more. So Every time you do this, you set up your precedent, especially when it comes to TIF rebate agreements, the terms and the conditions that are in there. Um, do these TIF, does TIF match up with your long range goals and objectives for the city? And I do have one TIF, a written TIF policy in case you'd like to see it. If you send me an email, I'll send it to you. Uh, I got it last year from Bondurant. Bondurant has a kind of a written TIF policy. Years ago, I don't think we have anybody here from Cascade doing. Nobody knew Oh, Pascal, you might check in your files. You might have something that might be quite old, like 10, 15 years old, where one of your previous city administrators, it might have been Randy Lansing, wrote a TIF policy. Whether or not you still use it, I don't tell you. Okay? If you find it, send me a copy. Okay? <laughs> so, have a good, I might have been have a good uh, TIF policy, but um, as far as I know, very few cities have done that sort of thing. Okay. As a way of wrap up, let's get to my tip suggestions. Here's how I would approach tip if I were you. And this is a good summary now. Here's my checklist. Get a good binding attorney, number one. Clearly understand the project, what it is you're doing, why you're proposing it. 
clearly define the purpose of the tip. Why are you doing this in the first place? Why do we have it? Okay. Don't be afraid to ask good questions. Ask good questions of your bonding attorney, ask good questions of your developers, whoever. There is no such thing as a dumb question. Hey, never feel embarrassed about asking a question of these folks that are you're working with on these tip projects. Reserve judgment. Too many cities have that developer come through the front door and they're so hungry for development. It's like, what do you want me to do? We'll do whatever it takes to get you. No. <laughs> Show appreciation. Okay, I get it. Show appreciation, but do not promise them anything until you see it all on the table clearly laid out and you've had an opportunity to decide, is this a good thing or a bad thing for our city? And what have I committed the city to? And what precedence am I taking? Then conduct a good tip analysis of the, uh, I, I think, look at your tip community and look at your city as your history of tip. What have you used it for in the past? What are you using for today? And what do you hope to use TIP for in the future? I actually did this one time with um, McGregor and Cascade. In fact, you might find the old report way back in your files where I did a, what I call a TIP analysis for Cascade when, uh, when Tim Long was there. So I've only done two of them. I, I don't, I've never had much of a request for that. Okay, next item is the uh, TIP. Each and every project, I think you should do a pro and cons analysis. Is this a good idea for the city to do? Or is this not such a good idea? I used to do this in Anamosa. One time I did one of these, I did a complete pros and cons analysis, and I was convinced the cons were so much more than the pros that I'd come up with on this developer uh, was proposing a commercial development. <laughs> and uh, I thought, there's no way the cons is going to go. Because I usually, if they want my opinion, I'll say, yeah, I would vote no, I would vote yes. I always gave them pros and cons. Much to my surprise, they totally ignored all my cons and just were so focused on getting development. Like, where do we sign? And so that's how a lot of your councils are. So you need to kind of you know, talk to them a little bit, slow them down a little bit if you think they're making a mistake. I should have stopped. At least, well, I should have attempted to stop. And then you can't stop a council you know, uh, from doing things that maybe they shouldn't do. But anyway, do a good pros and cons analysis. Have that tip calendar in place. The handout I gave you had a calendar I put together for a project in Anamosa. Clearly show what the step is and what your target date is or what your drop dead date is. So you don't miss something. And then as you go down through the steps, check them off, check them off, check them off. Otherwise, you might miss an important step in the process. And now you got to start all over. And you don't want to do that. You want to clearly define a calendar. I identify that team that we talked about. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And that is, here's another thing that you won't read in the code and you won't hear people talk about. And that is, be cautious when it comes to retail competition. Usually they're industries that are coming in town. There's no competition, but retail competition. I will give you an example of a city. That have, this is the, the person, the actual developer reached out to me and said, well, I want to do this, I want to do this Council, I want the council to give me a tip rebate. So I'm going to build a brand new building. And I said, that's all well and good. I said, um, you have a competitor. Yes, I have a competitor in town. I says, did that competitor get a tip um, rebate agreement when they built their brand new building 15 years ago? Well, I don't know. I don't know. And I says, maybe that's a good question to ask. Because if I'm that competitor <laughs> and I read in the paper, <laughs> that we just brought a new competitor to town and that person got a tip rebate, which means they could keep their rates a little lower. <laughs> Whoa, now I have an, you know, you have an unfair advantage over that current existing business that was in town for years and years and paying them all the property taxes. So in order to be fair to everyone, always ask yourself the question, do we need to slow down here and think about retail competition? A perfect example is a grocery store. Let's say, for example, well, Cascade is a good example. You've got that nice little brother's grocery store there. What would you do tomorrow if hy V suddenly said, you know what? Cascade will make a perfect place for a brand new hy V store. And we'll build that brand new hy V store as long as we can get a tip rebate. Can we get a tip rebate from Cascade City Council? <laughs> Probably not, which, because if they do give that rebate to hy V, what do you think is going to happen to brother's grocery store? <laughs> They're going to go down the tubes. You know? And so always have that in the back of your mind. What am I doing to my 
long time faithful businesses in my community by jumping at that brand new business and what have I now done to my local business, okay? Don't ever forget that. I guess one of my key points, if you remember nothing else from these presentations, that's one to think about though. You're not gonna find it in any handouts and you're not gonna find it in any code of Iowa section. Okay, prepare cash flow projections, okay? If you're borrowing money, and you're using TIF revenue to pay back the loan, sit down and do a cash flow projection and say, this is how much money is going to be coming in and when it's going to come in. Now I've got to structure my bond issue to make sure that I got enough money to make the annual payment. You know, this is where your financial advisors come into play. That's why that financial advisor is part of this team. They can do those projections for you. They can say, well, based upon what you told me, Tip money will start rolling in in this fiscal year. And this is how much you're going to get. And then this is what the debt's going to be. And if year one, we don't have any tip money, and now we got to pay a principal and interest payment, where's that money coming from? Where are we to get the money to make that payment? We don't have any tip money yet because it's still coming in. Well, guess what? The local taxpayer has now got to foot the bill of that first one. So good cash flow projections of what lies ahead. Okay. Compare then to tip revenue predictions to what your debt payment schedule is going to be. Okay. Next slide. Here's another one. You ever think, well, why, 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 why would the legislatures be so concerned about tip and want to, you know, really restrict us on how we use it? I didn't realize what was going on until I became a board of supervisors member in Jones County. The gentleman died. I filled the slot for a year and a half. Went to the county meetings. Went to the county workshops. Guess what's going on, folks? County officials, a lot of them don't like to, even though they can do it, they don't like to because it, they think it's money that should have gone into the county coffers to help pay the bill. <laughs> and because of tip, they got to wait 10 years to get that new property tax money. So they, guess who they talk to? They talk to the state legislators and say to them, this tip that this city is doing is the worst thing we ever did in our area. I can't believe that they agreed to that tip. And now I got to sit and wait 10 years to get my tax money. Well, that sinks in the mind of the, of the uh, state legislature. You need to make a concerted effort to go to your board of supervisors, get on their agenda every time you do tip and say, folks, I'm here to explain to our city what tip we are doing at TRIP, why it's so important. And these are the benefits that you will reap someday that we will all reap someday because of this project. Because without TIF, this isn't happening. And so if you can get them to understand what's behind your thinking as to why TIF is such a great thing, you will help them a statewide so that the legislatures understand that, you know, TIF is basically a pretty good thing. And the same thing with the school district. Make it a point to go meet with your superintendent or your school board, explain to them what's going on with TIF in your community and why you're using it. And lastly, we already talked about the uh, have a written tip policy. Another reason it's good to have a written tip policy, in my opinion, is council members come and go. Okay, I'll guarantee you, probably you're a rare city. If the people <laughs> sitting in those council seats are going to be the same people sitting in those council seats when that tip district expires, <laughs> I'm, I, almost every city has a little turnover every so often. Sometimes it's a lot of turnover. So. The next person coming in, you need to have something to hand to them and say, this is how we have used TIF for in the past. And you might, um, you know, it might even be a campaign issue in some of your communities, I don't know, where, where if you're abusing TIF, the uh, next person running for council may say, you guys have gone overboard on TIF, you know. And I will also tell you that, uh, and I won't name the city, but I'm quite familiar with it, and that is, I see this in some lot of cities, there's the haves versus the have-nots, okay? There's an element of the population. Um, uh, they, they've always worked for someone else, which is fine, but they've just barely had enough to get by. And then there's the other element of the population, what I call the haves. They are the people, the entrepreneurs in your community. They have started businesses. They have been quite successful in these businesses. And there's a jealousy that takes place between them, okay? <laughs> there's a jealousy between the haves and have-nots. You know, once again, you're not going to find that in a handout. You're not going to find that in any code book that you're going to read, but I'm telling you it exists, okay? I hear it, okay? What happens when TIF gets in the middle of this is the council approves a TIF. 
who's going to get the advantage of the tips? The haves in the community. And the have nots are going to say, oh, there they go again, get another break for the rich and famous in our community. It's that little run thing that takes effect in your community. The more you can do to explain tip to the whole community, why you have it, why it works, the better off you will be. Once again, that's why you have a written tip policy so that the whole community can see this is why we're using TIP and this is the advantage of it. And yes, you know, the rich and famous may benefit from it once in a while. So if you don't think that's got taking place in your community, uh, I, I bet you it is. You just maybe not hear about it. So, but I've seen it, uh, I've seen it quite often. Okay, last few items, my suggestions. Regular reviews of TIP, okay? Take a look at what you're doing, why you're doing it. New council members come on the scene. You get a new county auditor comes on the scene. You get a new bond attorney. Bring those players up to speed in what you're doing and why. And uh, well, like I said, make it part of your council orientation for that. By the way, at the next league meeting in September, I'm going to do a whole session on why you have to have a good city council orientation program. Why you need to help these people um, who have never experienced city government before so you can help them hit the ground running and have a good understanding of what this new job is that they got. So, and then stay consistent. <laughs> Always be thinking in terms of, I do this, I'm setting a precedent. So you want to stay <laughs> consistent. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, let's go to the next slide. And that is keep learning about TIP. I, I learned something new. I've been in this a long, long time. I'm constantly learning something different that I had not been aware of before. So uh, don't feel embarrassed when suddenly you think, Oh, that's part of it I never understood until now suddenly the light comes up. I've had parts of TIP like that over the years where I, I just had a hard time understanding that particular concept and then all of a sudden the light came on and I get it. That's what maybe happened to you folks if you're new to TIP. When you do some great stuff, brag about it, let people know. And lastly, don't abuse TIP. <laughs> you know, other cities out there have abused it. It's give TIP a bad name. Um, and so please don't do that. But once again, you can't control sometimes what your council does. Okay. Last few items, the tip analysis. Um, the next page. I think it's really important if you're if you're kind of at that point where you've had a tip a long time and maybe you haven't done much with it lately, step back and kind of do that past, present, and current future uses of it. Re-examine the advantages of it, the purpose of it. And then next slide is talk to your legislators from time to time. Let them know that you have been using TIF because I, it seems like every general assembly TIF is on the table for discussion. So we got to keep those folks educated in what we're doing, keep the council educated. Um, we've already heard, uh, we got through this last session, TIF, uh, Mickey sh shared, her, TIF didn't get hurt too bad this session. Uh, that's good, but I can guarantee you, it's going to be on the, it's going to be on the agenda in the 2024 session, which is like it always is. So. Next slide. Anyone using TIF right now? Let's start with the. Um, we already talked about tax abatement, so we got that covered. How about TIF commercial? How many of you are doing a TIF commercial or have done in recent years? Manchester, Lacoque. What do you know, Lacoque? Well, yeah. I, I'm just not very familiar with the IV dollar crowd. Oh, the IV thing one. Oh, okay. that's by 80. Okay. What have you done in commercial and customer? Well, we 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 have done several rebate agreements with oh. Dollar Fresh, but we also have that downtown incentive program that oh, yeah. I created several years ago. Yes, has a bunch of different grants for our downtown businesses uh, that's funded through TIF. Oh, really? Um, oh, that's cool. For facade interior, yeah. uh, most of them are one third, two third match, where we match one third up to seventy five hundred dollars. Yeah. So neat program. I can get yeah. more information. Okay. To anybody who's interested. Okay. Um, I know Cascades used to it for a long time. Okay. I think our newest one will be like um, we're bringing in like a butcher shop, a meat locker. Oh, okay. In our industrial area. Okay. That's good. Piasta has a lot. Yeah. What's that? Piasta. Oh, yeah. Airway, Dollar General, all of the people started here. Yeah. A lot. It goes on and on. I think we only have commercial. Oh, anybody else using yeah, TIP? Um, we just built a new Dollar General. Like, oh, oh, my Dollar General example was perfect yeah. for you then. And what city is this? Wyoming. Wyoming, okay. Uh, yeah, I drive by that every once in a while. That's a nice looking story. Yeah. Who else has used TIP? Did Preston use TIP at all? Yes. 
We use it for a downtown incentive program oh, for business. Yeah. Okay. They've hired to put it together. Oh, uh, so there you go. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So, did anybody tell Dave he wasn't supposed to retire? <laughs> I, we tried. He, I don't think he hardly has. <laughs> if, you, if you text him, he responds. Oh, does he? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else using okay. typical commercial? Okay, what about um, housing projects, residential here? Anybody doing residential? I know. Yeah, yeah you have one. Yeah, I was going to say that LMI requirement is actually, you know, I think DeWitt has a pretty good program where they're helping people. Oh, okay. Well, that's a good one. DeWitt. Okay. Yeah. Good. I don't think uh, we have no one signed up for DeWitt. Okay. Okay. Any other residential tips out there that work? Yes. Yeah. So we did one in the past and they're working on a development agreement right now. Oh, what city is this now? Burlington. Burlington. Okay. Good. That'll be interesting. We're yes. using it to finance our subdivision. Okay. We the city was the yeah. developer. Okay. So we're hoping to get some new houses. Good. Okay. So a lot of examples out there for you to use to. So okay. Um, any other comments on that? Okay. Let's go to my handouts real quickly, just to let you know what's there. <clears throat> um a lot of stuff I got in that handout came from John Danos, kind of things that you can use as a checklist. Um, Bob Johnston, who I mentioned, passed away a couple of years ago, did a great question and answer thing. That's a good handout for council members, that Q&A. If you want to get them familiar with what TIP is all about, uh, Bob did a nice Q&A thing uh, on TIP. I think it's helpful. The league handouts are good, good items as well. Um, Various things on the league website for good. The policy leader handbook. You should all have a policy leader handbook. If you don't, get get a hold of Mickey and get one. It has a section on tip. Um, I think the city clerk's manual has a section on tip, doesn't it? So you should all have that city clerk's manual sitting on your shelf back in the office. That probably has a good uh, section on tip as well. Provides some things. So, um, last slide. Any questions that? We didn't get answered along the way. Did you answer before we wrap it up? Yes, yeah. I heard that urban revive schools are protected now from urban revive as of this legislature as well. That's a new one. I haven't heard that one. Check into that. Okay. Okay. So I would tend to believe that if they hit that, they're probably going to try that with TIF next year. Yes. Yeah. But uh, to my question, yeah. say you have a project that's well, past the cost of what you anticipated. Yeah. Can you go back and request more money than like an urban renewal plan? Or you um, yeah, can you can you can always amend the urban renewal plan. And you just have to start over go through a very similar process. You can go back and amend it. Yes. Yeah. Lots of these. Good night, line with flat. Street. What's that? I said the project might rhyme with flat. Oh, that, that, that's it. Yeah. I hadn't heard that. Okay, got it. But yeah, you can, but once again, <laughs> amending amend doesn't mean you get more money unless there's more construction. So even there's amending a plan, plan doesn't, there's no guarantee you're going to get more, more tip money. Once again, no construction, no tip. That's all I have for you.